Hello everybody, welcome to Dry Dock episode 96. This is the Patreon Dry Dock, the monthly one. So let's see if this month's me measures have been effective and we're not stuck all stuck here for half a day. <laughs> Who knows, it might only be about three hours or so. If it's, if it's got down to around about that, I'll be happy. Anyway, shall we proceed? Ben from upstate New York asks, Watching the battle scene clip from the 1957 film Yangtze Incident, the story of HMS Amethyst, I noticed the wheelhouse below the bridge had no windows, no portholes or slits for the helmsman to see forward. This seems to be confirmed by looking at photographs of the Black Swan class, which also show that vision forward from the wheelhouse will be blocked by the twin 4-inch B mount anyway. How common was this arrangement on warships? So this was not very common, although it did crop up once or twice in a few other ship designs. But the main reason for this is, well, due to the origins of the Black Swan class. Remember, their sloops designed for convoy escort work, which means effectively in the, this time period, primarily anti-submarine work. Now, with the best will in the world, you're not going to see a submarine regardless, and the wheelhouse is only one of several steering positions aboard a ship. However, when you're in a Black Swan class, you are probably going to be encountering some pretty nasty weather, and you may or may not be under air attack, depending. Um, but when it comes to the orders that obviously will necessitate which way you turn, assuming that the wheelhouse is where you're manning the steering from, there is obviously the bridge level one higher. And then orders can be communicated either by voice pipe or just by yelling down a hatch, depending on what's appropriate at the time, to tell you where to go. Now, obviously, ideally, you would want to be able to have your helmsman see where he's going as well. But on something the size of a Black Swan class, putting everything one deck higher, so you have an enclosed wheelhouse and bridge structure where the open bridge is um, on the ship itself, and then having an open bridge one level higher because that is the best thing for the commanding officer and such like to be able to actually see near enough a full 360 for their operations escorting the convoys when the weather's not completely abysmal um that means that well on a ship this size that that's going to add a lot of weight high up which you don't want it might only be in the order of a few tons to a few tens of tons, but on something the size of a sloop and that high up, that's going to cause some interesting stability issues. So you have to compromise. Yes, you could put some windows in, but then as you say, you can't see through B mount. So what do you do? Do you delete half your forward armament? Probably not. Do you make the ship as unstable as a, a Hollywood celebrity who's had one too many binge parties? A, Again, probably not. So you just have to settle for, well, having orders communicated down to you from above. And as I say, there are alternate steering positions on the ship as well. The other thing you've got to remember with the Black Swans is that within that wheelhouse, it's not just the steering. They also had various plotting devices, both for radar and for, well, at the time it was ASDIC, and we now call it sonar. Um, and so these are the kind of things you really can't afford to get wet. So you can't have the thing open. And to be perfectly honest, in the Atlantic, um, at least in something the size of a, a sloop, having windows that low down in rough seas is a good invitation to get something broken. So there's method to the madness. Um, although, obviously, ideally, you would want uh, an open wheelhouse, not an open wheelhouse, a, a wheelhouse you could see out from if you had the displacement to do so. Daniel Ziegler asks, in World War II, how did one find themselves in command of a ship, say, the, the size of a destroyer or larger, in the American, British, Japanese, German, etc. navies? Especially curious how the Kriegsmarine maintained and trained new officers in between the wars. So, <laughs> for all of those navies, it's quite different, to be honest, um, it's in the details, because, well, there's a reason they're different navies. They all follow different systems. But... If you want to look for common threads, then obviously you would enlist in the Navy with the aim of becoming an officer. So that usually means you would become a midshipman or equivalent rank. And then you'd begin advancing up the tree of uh, command. Uh, 
you know, through uh, obviously lieutenant or lieutenant, depending on the navy you're in, and so on and so forth, um, as you go. And as part of that, you would obviously have your stated preference. Now we're presuming that your stated preference is command, but you would also have assessments by the navy to determine what a both what they needed, because if they have dozens of people who want to command and only a dozen ships, well, sorry, but someone's going to get shifted off to another career path. And then they're also going to look at how good you are from the suitable candidates. So, yeah, let's say we're talking about, a, I don't know, let's say we've got a Navy that's got 50 ships and there are 500 new enlistees who all want to command. Well, they're going to sort those out and go, right, OK, we only need a, a, a certain number of prospective future commanders. So first set of aptitude tests is to determine what people are particularly good at. Because if people have a natural command talent, then obviously they'll go be directed up that uh, tree first. But if it turns out you're not particularly good at command, but you might be good at engineering or you might be good at gunnery or anything else, then you'd be directed more along those lines. Now, that's not to say that you couldn't then become a commander. There were numerous officers who, in the early parts of their career, focused on very specific aspects of uh, technology. Um, Fisher, for example, was a gunnery nut. Um, so And so was Philip Vian, actually. And so these people obviously went on to very high rank, including ship command. Now, obviously, there's also the fact that as a midshipman or a lieutenant, you're not going to be in command of anything other than maybe a ship's boat. So you can't immediately join the command tree. You will have to be looking at one of these other specializations. But as part of the assessments, the the Navy in question is going to be looking to see, right, are you any good at that? And almost regardless of that, how do you show any other talents? So if you're... I don't know, assigned to an engineering team, if it turns out you actually, you're really good at organising the engineering team and getting results um, in the little section that you're assigned to, and you naturally seem to end up in charge a lot of the time because you just have that ability, but maybe you're a so-so actual engineer, then they might identify you as a potentially a future commander or captain, <laughs> I guess, the, technically. And once, as you progress through these early ranks, the Navy has a bit of a better handle on who wants to look for command and who they think is actually going to be good for command, then they can start giving command opportunities. And at that point, this is where further filtering comes through. Because if it turns out you're really, really good, if you're sort of a paragon of, of command, or you're exceptionally aggressive you'll probably be fast-tracked for a destroyer command because those are the two kinds of of um, people you'll, you'll get early destroyer commands. Either the insanely aggressive because, well, that's usually what navies want in their destroyer commanders, most navies at least. And if you're just generally very good, um, you might get put in a destroyer or similar size command early so that you've, st you've started on the definite command path and then they can get you relatively swiftly into something like a cruiser or a battleship or a carrier, or whatever else. Um, so, and then obviously you're going to be assessed as you progress through there to see if if your actual life skills are matching up to what they thought they would be. And then you might develop that way. So if you, if you are a good commander, but very aggressive, you might become first destroyer, then you might end up in command, well, second in command of a destroyer, command of a destroyer, then command of a flotilla division then command of a flotilla then and so on and so forth up that line if they want to keep you in destroyers or whatever uh, as far as the kriegsmarine are maintaining and training new officers it's pretty much that um they did build a number of ships in the interwar period it's just they think didn't have so many of them so they could only maintain a small core of officers and men um, but for example where for a the 1920s when they weren't really in the business of building destroyers they built torpedo boats instead so that mm, near enough just makes no difference although they're mostly coastal they give the same kind of command and training opportunities as larger destroyers would be but naval cultures vary quite significantly so the exact details are going to change and exactly what level of uh, obeying obedience to high command versus 
aggressiveness they want will also vary from navy to navy. Coos Army 0001 asks, historically the British tend to have fairly large islands on their carriers as opposed to American carriers which are generally smaller, um, amphibious assault ships being an exception. Can you elaborate on the design and operational philosophies that created these differences and the advantages dash disadvantages of the different approaches? Now, technically, it's very it's a bit of a difficult trend to pick up on, to be honest, because whilst, yes, the Lexington and Saratoga's islands were, well, let's face it, mostly funnel, um, <laughs> the early British carriers weren't exactly endowed with the world's biggest islands past the initial conversions. I mean, okay, fair enough. Hermes and Eagle do have very large islands, but then Courageous, Glorious have fairly small islands. Furious, of course, doesn't have one at all. Um, Ark Royal's island is actually pretty small when you look at it compared to the uh, funnel, certainly, and overall. Where perhaps you start to see a little bit more of this is when you're looking at something like the the Yorktown and Essex class versus the illustrious implacable class classes. Um, so yeah, there you can see a little bit more of a trend where the British carriers tend to have slightly larger islands compared to their US counterparts. Now with the very, very earliest ships, um, Eagle and um, well, Hermes as well, a lot, well, with Eagle, it's because it's a converted battleship. They're just sticking everything on top. So any carrier functionality that you need from a bridge structure has to be within Eagle's uh, bridge. Plus, of course, remember, there was that whole fantastic idea about having it some kind of weird tor mass torpedo armed, heavily gun protected through deck cruiser night action demon thing for fighting enemy cruiser squadrons that BT came up with, which I'm still not entirely sure how much opium was being smoked at that particular point in time. But we shall go on. Looking over the blueprints of the Yorktowns and Essexes versus the blueprints of the Illustriouses, I think where you get this development um, of the sort of the World War II British carriers generally having somewhat larger islands is actually, believe it or not, it comes back around to the armoured issue. Um, not specifically directly whether or not something is armoured, but what implications that has. Now, with the armoured carriers, uh, as was mentioned in my armoured carrier versus unarmoured, well, armoured versus unarmoured flight deck or hangar, as it should one more probably be video anyway, um, the British carriers had to make a few sacrifices for the armour, and one of those sacrifices was a lower ceiling in their hangars. Now, if you look at the uh, profiles for the Yorktowns and the Essexes, what you'll notice is there's quite a large number of rooms, offices, etc. Immediately in the vicinity of the, the aircraft carrier's island, but under the flight deck, basically suspended underneath the flight deck and above the hangar deck. Um, of course, when Bunker Hill was hit, this would be where a lot of casualties uh, occurred because of, well, being effectively hanging rooms, they couldn't be especially heavily built, but that's neither here nor there. It's just where they were. And so obviously, if you've got this, this functionality down there, you don't need it on the island. And if you don't need it on the island, then you make the island smaller. As simple as that. The reason for this is, of course, the higher up in the ship you go, the more a uh, given amount of weight affects the ship's stability. So when you are building your carrier, ideally speaking, you actually want a light, as lightweight and small an island as you can get away with, unless there's a very, very good reason um, to have a large one. And obviously with the armoured carriers, if you don't have that height in your hangar, uh, deck to be able to fit rooms above the aircraft then those rooms have to go in the island because your only other option is to put them much lower in the ship and these kinds of rooms we talk about command and control for the ship command and control for the air groups um, places to store your pilots etc all of this kind of stuff you need close to the flight deck um, or ideally above it if you can 
Um, but some of the stuff that can go further down below can be stored in American carriers, but not so much in the British ones. So that makes the British um, islands a bit larger. The other thing is that due to the British being in the 30s slightly ahead of the US Navy when it came to radar, and of course the illustrious being slightly later on the order books as compared to the York towns, it meant that the need for a considerable mast to support these of the new radio and radar etc based communications and uh, sensor systems was something that could be built in uh, or anticipated a little bit better on the illustrious as compared to the york towns and so that also having a sort of a bigger base for your for a larger mast does appear on uh, comparably and obviously when Implacable and Essex are being built, which are roughly contemporaneous, um, this is where you see both sets of ships, islands expanding to accommodate that. But Implacable obviously has to still account for the fact it can't have underflight deck rooms and it needs um, it needs to have that space. The other thing as well, one final bit, is aircrew. Because remember, the in the fleet air arm, up until, well, actually even whilst Implacable's being designed, the fighter is a two-man aircraft. So for 12 aircraft, you have 24 people. And on a US ship, you don't. It's just one-man fighter. So that means that the individual rooms you use, both to store your aircrew ready to go and to brief your aircrew, etc., have to be much larger. So you might only be carrying... Uh, in well, North Sea conditions, 36, 48 aircraft. Um, in the Pacific conditions, 50, 60 plus. As opposed to the 70 to 100 you might find on various sizes of American carrier. But you've got to remember that one, the number of aircraft carried on an American carrier doesn't necessarily equate to serviceable aircraft and therefore doesn't necessarily equate to pilot numbers. Um, and two it's in when you when you take into account serviceable aircraft it's not double so you, even with say 60 70 percent of the aircraft you're going to end up with more men on a royal navy carrier because all, all of your fighters obviously basically doubling up in numbers until later on when you get things like the sea fire and the martlet dash wildcat etc john mccarthy says, I've seen statements online that Bismarck had critical communications cables, such as fire control ones, above the armoured deck and therefore vulnerable to damage. Is this true? I'm sceptical because it seems like such a serious error even for inexperienced German designers. I've searched my reference books as well and found no mention of this flaw. So this is one of uh, the more contentious things that you do find online and not helped by, of course, the fact that there is... Um, yeah, shall we, shall we say some very entrenched camps when it comes to whether or not Bismarck was good or not? And uh, both sides have rather, some rather extreme views, shall we say. Nevertheless, when it comes to general communications cables, that much I couldn't say for certain. Um, in part because, well, pretty much every plan and blueprint that I've managed to find for Bismarck, no matter how detailed, don't appear to include these details. So, um, yeah, I suppose there's probably a document out there somewhere in German that says something about it, but um, it's not something I've come across translated into English, so... Well, there you go. There's been a few arguments about some rather annoyingly vaguely named corridors and such, but whatever. When it comes to fire control specifically, no, they do not appear to have run them above the armoured deck, but where the whole thing about unarmoured fire control cables comes from, I think I've managed to track down what it means. There are three primary fire control positions for Bismarck. There's obviously the big one, which is up on the uh, top of the main mast, just forward of the funnels. Um, it's probably more of a tower, really, but never mind. And then you have a forward and an aft uh, fire control systems, which you can see sort of just aft of the bridge and forward of and forward of the uh, third turret, Caesar turret. 
Now, um, these ones, the, the secondary command stations, definitely have a armoured tube that runs from them down to below the armoured turtleback deck. The main fire control station, however, doesn't. And I think this is where a lot of this comes from, because on American and British ship design, there was still an armoured tube running from the primary fire control all the way down to below the armoured deck to carry the cables. Now, granted, none of these tubes are the world's thickest tubes, but they'll still protect you from blast and splinter damage. Basically, you'd have to land a direct hit or very, very close near miss with something fairly powerful to sever the cables. Whereas on Bismarck, I say that tower does not appear to have enjoyed that particular benefit, which is a bit of an odd omission, to be honest. Um, and this is then coupled with that whilst the, the feeds from the prime, from the two secondary control stations are armoured, because the turtle back deck is much lower down in the ship, it means that those tubes are much longer than they would have otherwise be if it had a more conventional um, all-or-nothing armour approach with a higher level uh, main armour deck. So what that means is the feeds from the secondary control stations are more vulnerable to being hit, uh, or to, for sh shells hitting the body of the ship to take them out. Um, well, in the event, the fire control stations themselves just got physically removed from existence, so that didn't really help matters. Um, but it also meant that specifically with a main fire control station, the hit that appears to have disabled it actually appears to have been a hit to the bridge if i recall correctly and it's the blast shell shockwave and splinters that riddle the primary fire control well the area immediately below the primary fire control position although that also gets totaled short in shortly thereafter but anyway um and that would have taken out the connection to from primary fire control to the turrets so there's potentially a few minutes within bismarck's engagement between the hit to the bridge and uh, the hit that actually totals the fire control systems directly where if those systems had been armored from the main fire control position that might have actually retained the ability to direct its fire effectively for a little bit longer so yes there were unarmored fire control cables and there were fire control control cables that whilst armoured were more vulnerable than they otherwise should have been but um, I think that gets conflated with the deck position and the fact that the German plans and blueprints at least as available in the English speaking world are not particularly clear and half the German ones don't appear to be either um, and so you get this sort of translated into unarmoured therefore must mean running above the armoured deck and as I say there were some cables that ordinarily you would find below an armoured deck that were above the armoured deck because of lack of space um, but as far as I can tell they're not the fire control cables specifically and as I've said before on a couple of dry docks um, and such when I've talked to one of the Bismarck's survivors as well um, he did mention that in his conversations with the, the turret crew and fire control crews in the forward part of the ship, obviously before everything went to bits, um, they were having issues with um, information transmitted from the primary fire control position, even when they weren't being hit, just from the shock of their own guns. And of course, we know the shock of the guns knocked out the radar, which is a whole separate issue, which I have to do a video on at some point. Um, but that does seem to bear out that not having these cables protected at all actually was putting the putting the ship's fire control system at risk from its own battery, let alone any enemy action. Wings of Wrath asks, what would have been the duties of a Royal Navy midshipman on a destroyer circa 1910, and would these duties have changed with the start of war? So midshipmen, well, generally, but especially in the sort of World War One, World War II time period, have three primary duties one learn um two keep your journals and three dog's body work um <laughs> and uh, yeah effectively in that in that descending order they would be assigned to various watches under more senior officers and their primary duty as midshipmen given how young a lot of them still are were um you know, probably still are relative to what we expect socially these days but anyway definitely at the time um 
their primary objective was to learn their ship and to learn the duties of the officers that they were effectively shadowing because they're for all the the best one in the world they've gone to various training colleges and such but nothing compares between theory and actual practice so yeah keep keeping an eye on whichever officer you've been assigned to learning what they do learning why they do it learning how to do it more efficiently than perhaps your books and papers told you also as I said maintaining your journals and this is because if you wanted to become a lieutenant then you would need to sit your lieutenant's examination and to, as part of that they would ask you show us your journals and the journals were basically evidence of the fact you'd actually been doing your job evidence of what you'd learned evidence of what you'd observed perhaps that was maybe direct outside of the direct learnings you needed to do um and then you've also got uh other things you might have seen so maps that you might draw um, sketches etc and not only was this evidence of you actually doing something other than just lying about and uh, hiding in a corner but it also would clue in the examination board as to where you might be suited career-wise which actually flips back to uh, an earlier question because if it turns out that oh wow these these drawings of harbors and such you've visited are really good then that might perhaps harken towards a career in navigation or charting and plotting whereas if there's a lot of, of detailed observations and accurate ones about the status of the men and who could improve in what then perhaps this is suggestive of command whereas if there's lots of stuff about well this mechanism didn't work i fixed that mechanism here's a drawing of a of a gear train and how i think it could be bettered maybe engineering is your forte and so on and as then I said, the dog's body work, because there, there's never a dull moment aboard a warship. It might feel like it, but there's always something to do. And if you don't believe me, then find an officer and they'll find you something to do. They'll, they will have a whole list of things that you never knew you had to do aboard a ship until you had the good fortune to ask one of them. Um, and so this could be, well, to be honest, on a, on a British ship, you would that would probably be making tea or making cocoa, depending on the ship and the uh, area that you're in in question keeping logs marking charts well if the navigation officer would let you anywhere near the precious charts um, and such like so yeah it, it was a, a very steep learning curve where you had to record evidence of your learning and make yourself generally useful until you could actually be useful once the war starts then things get a little bit different you're still supposed to keep records and help out generally because that's how you advance but obviously with a direct war going on your your role especially at sea is going to be configured much more towards the the keeping the ship alive part so whereas a whole gaggle of midshipmen might be all over the place um at various stations in peacetime in wartime you would generally find midshipmen levying up the gun crews and uh helping out with the watch with literally the watch officers i.e the ones who are looking out for the ship looking out and around to look for enemy contacts because more eyes are better and of course gun crews are going to take casualties so you need more more hands there to work the guns faster get the ammunition up faster and when casualties start to come make sure that the gun crew stays operational for as long as possible so more active work would take precedence over the more general work although obviously even in wartime action is relatively rare so the, the sort of the, the general dog's body work would still continue um but perhaps the more detailed and uh shall we say bureaucratic parts of keeping track of exactly what you were and weren't doing would take a little bit of a distant place in wartime as compared to in peace ally arthur asks rudder damage is one of the more critical things that can happen to a ship however to my layperson's eye there appears to be little difference between a warship and a merchantman are there damage protections built into military rudders and if it does get damaged what can a captain do about it there are some differences between military and merchant rudders generally speaking you'll find a warship tends to have more rudder area 
for a given tonnage than a merchant ship because obviously agility is slightly more valuable in a warship than it is in a merchant ship and because and also because warships tend to run at somewhat higher speeds than most merchant ships you'll tend to find that the rudders have considerably more powerful motors and mechanisms because well you can see the size of a person next to the Iowa's rudders here and yeah if if you try and turn something that size against a flow of water that's passing over it when you're motoring along north of 30 knots the water's going to have something to say about that and we'll try and keep the rudder basically in this kind of position so you need some pretty powerful uh pretty powerful motors to be able to turn the rudder against that force and then of course turn it back and make sure the thing just doesn't get flipped around broadside or something like that so yeah M military rudders tend to be somewhat sturdier because of the operational constraints laid upon them obviously the ship itself the hull is divided into more watertight sections and that will include specifically around weak spots such as the rudders because yeah, it's, it's one of the few areas where you voluntarily have to have a hole poke, poke through the hull of your ship, so make sure there's plenty of watertight compartments up there. But in terms of damage protection, things like armouring and such, there's not a tremendous amount you can do, to be perfectly honest, because the whole way that rudders work is by affecting the water flow past the ship. If you enclose your rudders, they can't do that if you put battles and such like um, screening your rudders well a that's probably going to slow your ship down b it's going to reduce their effectiveness because again you're preventing a certain amount of the water flow coming through and also given that remember the rudders are deflecting a flow of water if you had a baffle hanging down to maybe catch an incoming torpedo the minute you turn your rudder in that direction so from this point of view in the picture if we turn if the rudders were turned hard to starboard the deflected flow of water would probably just tear that screen clean off um without a moment's thought unless that screen was well this thing if the screen's light enough to just bend out of the way it's light enough to bend out the way of a torpedo and if it's heavy enough to resist it's going to put massive strain in the hull and weigh a massive amount of uh, of, of displacement and then again negatively affect the ability of your rudder to operate it's a perennial weak spot on on any kind of warship and there's a limited amount you can do but as I said, there were things small things and medium scale things that could be done to protect them if they do get damaged it's largely a matter of how the ship was built with something like bismarck um where it's difficult to steer with the engines if the rudder's jammed there's not a tremendous amount you can do with something along the lines of an Iowa or any other of the more traditional treaty era and post treaty era battleships. With four screws, it's easier to steer with your propellers. And also, as you can see in this case, there are in fact two parallel rudders. So if one of them gets broken, you hopefully should be able to use the other one at least somewhat to counter it. Kent W. Feverly asks, how many and which navies maintained ships on the Yangtze River? Well, it depends the exact time period you're talking about. Um, in terms of the larger navies, there were quite a number that had patrol boats on the Yangtze River. So obviously the Americans and the British were there for quite a while with reasonably large numbers of, of ships, boats, hmm, don't know quite what you want to call them. Um, but also the French, the Austro-Hungarians, the Germans, the Russians, the Japanese, the Portuguese, and believe it or not, even the Chinese um, did show up with patrol boats on the Yangtze River at various points. Most of these latter navies tended to be around at the mid part of the 19th century. Um, in the period just after the Opium Wars, and then again in the sort of build up to and especially the aftermath of the Boxer Uprising in uh, the latter part of the colonial period. And of course, when the Sino Japanese Wars 
plural were ongoing um obviously the japanese would find uh, magically suddenly a very good reason to operate lots of gunboats on the yangtze and other chinese rivers in terms of how many um anything up to 12 uh, was probably about the largest individual flotilla outside of direct wartime situations but on average the the larger navies present would usually have around about half a dozen or so present at the in the, in the average um, deployment period and as i say this could trend up or down depending on what those navies obligations elsewhere were and quite how tense the situation in china was at the time Sui 420 Den asks, how important were Lend-Lease aircraft to the fleet air arm? They were very important um, in two particular roles. In the fighter-fighter-bomber role, supplies of the Wildcat, Hellcat and Corsair were incredibly important because they gave the fleet air arm single-seat fighter aircraft that were designed from the start to operate from carriers, which... Um, well, and high-performance ones at that, which was uh, something the fleet air arm was lacking because they had a choice of either two-seat aircraft like the Fulmar and later the Firefly, which, well, the Fulmar did all right in 1940, um, not so well after that in most cases, and the Firefly, similarly, it was better than the Fulmar, but still um not something you want to particularly take up after a zero um and then you've got the things like the sea hurricane and the sea fire which are adapted to varying degrees depending on the model from land-based aircraft and so not as well suited to carry operations something designed from the ground up for that purpose especially when you get into the debates about radial versus inline engines and visibility for landing um slightly uh, bendy landing gear and so forth so having the having the ability to field these kinds of uh, aircraft in fighter terms was very useful and you actually ended up with the multiplicity of different fighter types that the fleet aaron was operating being used to cover different aspects of uh, the the fleet's air defence. One of the very important things about it was that the uh, Lend-Lease aircraft gave the fleet air arm the ability to conduct long-range high-performance fighter escort and patrol duties. Um, because whilst in the case of stopping incoming enemy air raids, for example, the sea fire was actually pretty much the best of the lot, especially once you got right towards the end of the war the griffin engine powered ones because uh, the sea fire like the spitfire was a very basically an interceptor it was very good at its job it could just go rocketing up into the sky at a rate of knots that nobody else could really match um but when you're talking about long term um the sea fire does not have the world's biggest fuel tanks and even with additional drop tanks it can't really compete with the range and endurance of the Lend-Lease aircraft. Now, the Fulmar and the Firefly, yeah, they can compete, but, well, they're, tw they're twin-seat fighters versus uh, single-seaters. So, yeah, definitely important in that respect. And the other thing, of course, was the Avenger, which was a nice big chunky aircraft capable of doing torpedo bombing and conventional bombing. Um, fair enough, the Barracuda was also capable of doing this, but the Avenger was just huge and very durable and was also available in large numbers so as the royal navy's uh carrier arm is ex uh, carrier arm expanded quite considerably uh, as the war went on having the ability to call on relatively large numbers of modern strike aircraft and fighter aircraft especially with range which is obviously very important in aircraft carrier operations was very important to the fleet air arm although obviously they were continuing to try to develop their own homegrown solutions but it's fair to say that they were very important indeed darren lou asks what's your opinion of the i-400 submarines would they have been useful boats in a conflict or are they like the circouf military white elephants in the manner that they were built and at the time they were built the i-400s were basically a big waste of resources uh, with the best will in the world, lock gates are designed to stand up to quite considerable pressures. There's a reason that when uh, gates at the uh, dockyard in, in St. Nazier had to be taken out, 
the Royal Navy used an entire destroyer with its nose converted into a gigantic floating bomb, the idea that a handful of relatively lightweight flat pack aircraft could do significant damage to the Panama Canal locks is pretty laughable to be honest, but hey, they probably didn't have much else of a choice. They would have done some damage, but sorry, just no. Um, in and of themselves, the idea of a large, extremely long-range submarine capable of going across the Pacific or anywhere else in the world to attack people at their home bases, that does have a certain amount of merit. But two problems. One, aircraft are not the thing you use in a submarine to attack things, especially in World War II. And two, as I said, they were built far too late. Now, the reason I say this is because if you had built the I-400s and instead of going with the uh, silly tiny <laughs> aircraft carrier idea, gone with perhaps, say, equipping them with an absolute metric ton of torpedoes, and they've already got some decent torpedo tubes up, up front, so give them loads of torpedoes, send them out on long distance uh, attack. That might well have been workable because... And the, the reason I'm thinking this is, is twofold. One, specifically, the as they were famously intended to go for, the attack on the Panama Canal. The Panama Canal was not anywhere near as well defended at the very beginning of the war as it would later be. Uh, all the stuff did fall off a little bit later on. Um, but also, at, well, as the German U-boat showed on the East Coast, the US was not prepared to deal with submarine warfare activity off its own coast early on in the war. So if it had been me um, building the I-400s, I would say I would have stocked them full of torpedoes um, and tried to have at least one or two of them sail for the Panama Canal locks in advance of the Pearl Harbor attacks timed to uh, strike at the same time on the same day. Give them plenty of time to get there, obviously. And I would have sent others to operate off of the US West Coast. Because then, yeah, a couple of big heavy subs are volley firing torpedoes into the lock gates at the same time as the Kido Butai is attacking Pearl Harbor. That would do some fairly serious damage. And then coupled with uh, ships that are coming into and out of San Diego, Los Angeles... Um, and various other U.S. West Coast ports suddenly finding themselves being unexpectedly torpedoed um, and regularly, because obviously said, these things would be carrying lots of torpedoes, that could, I mean, it's again, it's not going to win the Japanese the war, but it's certainly going to hurt the Americans a lot, and it's going to force something of a delay, because you've got to then repair the damage that's done to the Panama Canal, you've got to... Um, divert anti-submarine resources to sanitize the U.S. West Coast, which is going to slow down shipping, which is going to sh slow down preparation efforts. Potentially, even you put down a few ship uh, ships, warships, and such like, which the U.S. would be in quite short supply of in the early part of the war. It would throw a lot of spanners into a lot of works, basically. Um, so yes, the the idea of this long range. Um, large attack submarine that could show up in unexpected places. Good idea. Building it in the middle of World War II and trying to make it a small submersible aircraft carrier. Very bad idea. David C. Warthen asks, what, if any, special measures or precautions did the Royal Navy take during the Spanish flu pandemic of 1918 to 1920? What problems did the pandemic cause the Royal Navy and were any measures that were taken effective? One thing you've got to bear in mind with the whole thing around the Spanish flu is that the theory of disease, although it had taken a significant jump in the latter part of the 19th and early 20th centuries, was nowhere near complete. Um, so the understanding of quite how all of this was happening, well, it was mostly there, but as I say, not, not as nowhere near as um, detailed as we'd understand it. The Royal Navy didn't really do quarantine and although given the current situation that might sound absurd um well one it's very difficult to quarantine people on a warship as a number of ships in various navies are currently finding out 
and that's with a much less infectious disease. And secondly, well, just the, the technology, the medical diagnosis equipment, etc., just wasn't there to the degree that it was, uh, that it is these days. Um, so the Royal Navy did take a number of measures against disease. One of the things that had come out of the 19th and to be honest even the 18th century was an appreciation that disease was quite often associated with and caused by unsanitary conditions so as best they could the royal navy was definitely determined to keep the interior of its ships spick and span although obviously when you're in a giant metal box full of hundreds of other people lots of steam plants and condensation there's a limited amount you can do but certainly the cleanliness measures that they undertook as a general thing were um, somewhat effective in limiting the impact, if not all that much. And there was, of course, the fact that if a outbreak was known in a particular port or section of the fleet, it was possible to redirect ships or just delay ships arriving, etc. Just you, well, it's fairly easy to isolate yourself on a warship when you're out at sea. Um, but with the, the way this thing spread and the way it uh, could take over, it there wasn't a lot you could do short of just physically staying away from the places that had it, which in the 1919 outbreak was not that many. Um, there weren't that many places other than just staying out at sea if you didn't have any cases already, and you couldn't do that indefinitely. You, even if you took on supplies, there was a chance of catching it from those. So, yeah, problems it caused, it, it, there were a number. I mean, it, over 10,000 men were sick at one point, which limited the Navy's uh, ability to operate. Fortunately, mostly after the major operations of the, Second, of the First World War were over, um, but when it came to things like uh, the war in the Baltic with the trying to put itself together Soviet Union, um, that there were limitations on what the Royal Navy could send out there because of the effects of the Spanish flu, not just on the ships themselves, but also on the support infrastructure and the men uh, that supplied that and, well, the men and women on shore, etc., in the Royal Navy. Uh, that supplied various bits of the industry that supported the Royal Navy. Um, in, ter in terms of measures effective taking, I say, because they didn't really think that this quarantine thing aboard ships and such like would actually be of any particular use, there was a limited degree of effectiveness um, to what they did. It certainly had some effect, but um, not, not a tremendous amount, unfortunately, outside of, well, keeping the ship as clean as possible, and obviously being mobile, being able to try and remove yourself from the worst of it where you could. Matthew Allen Adkins asks, Submarine warfare, specifically nations other than the Germans, Americans or Japanese, um, I'd like to hear about a few of the more impressive things that those who aren't in the top three have done. Okay, well, I will regale you with three brief tales, um, two of which will come from the Dutch Navy. The Dutch seem to have, a, given the number of submarines they had and the number of chances they had to have a go at someone, they seem to have had a remarkable degree of success at taking on German U-boats, of all things. Um, so, for example, the submarine O-21, as seen here, was on its way back into Gibraltar when it found itself being tailed by a German U-boat who hadn't quite managed to figure out what it was they were tailing. Um, this was one of the uh, small advantages Dutch submarines had. There weren't that many of them, and their profile was very different to British uh, submarines, and so the German U-boat was actually trying to figure out, is this a weird-looking German boat? Is it an Italian boat? Is it a British boat? They apparently didn't even stop to think it might have been a Dutch uh, submarine. And they paid for that, because when O21 realised she was being followed... She popped off a couple of torpedoes. The first one grazed down the side of U-95 uh, and didn't uh, explode, but because of that, uh, U-95 turned to, uh, to make evasive action and ended up turning into the path of the second torpedo, which blew its stern off, and, well, that was the end of that. O-21 very helpfully then turned around and came back and picked up survivors. Uh, later in the war, 
in <laughs> the Pacific Theatre, you have the Dutch submarine, and uh, apologies to my Dutch listeners, but Svartfish. I'm going to call it Swordfish because that's blatantly obvious what it actually means, in English at least. Um, so yeah, you might think so. Okay, Dutch submarine in the Pacific, not that common a sight in uh, 1944, but anyway... What's even less common a sight in the Pacific in 1944 is a German U-boat, specifically the U-168. And the uh, Swordfish was able to find this uh, German submarine motoring along on the surface and fire a spread of torpedoes and hit it with, apparently according to the survivors, three, albeit only one of them exploded, and sink it. And then again, picked up survivors um, that were left in the water. So yeah, Dutch submarines weirdly attracted to taking out German U-boats. And the other one comes from the submarine HMS Trenchant, a T-class submarine, again operating in the Pacific toward the end of the war, this time in June 1945. And Trenchant, uh, amongst other activities, including a brief encounter with the destroyer Kamikaze, found the cruiser Ashigara sailing past its station. Now, Ashigara was hugging the coastline in waters that Trenchant didn't expect it to go in, and so they found themselves in the rather unenviable situation of only having the barest of intercept uh, vectors. I Basically, the, the Ashigara would pass Trenchant's ability to fire at all relatively quickly, and the only firing solution they could come up with was one that was almost at the very edge of their range. And uh, so Trenchant used the T-Class's wonderful... Uh, forward torpedo battery, although it didn't fire the full spread of 10, it instead fired uh, only a spread of 8 torpedoes, which um, headed toward towards Ashigara, and then Ashigara found that, well, if you box yourself into the coast so closely, you can't really that make that much in the way of evasive manoeuvres, and the Japanese cruiser ended up taking 5 hits out of the 8 fired, um, which was um, something of a fatal blow to the Japanese heavy cruiser. So yeah, that remains quite the impressive feat, getting uh, five out of eight hits at basically a maximum range shot that you had to calculate in your head very, very quickly before the target sailed out of range completely. Robin McFarlane asks, when the Russian ship Oryol was taken into Imperial Japanese Navy service, what modifications did they do? So, as you can see here, there's kind of before and after pictures. There was some quite substantial changes. The picture on the left is the ship just after the uh, Battle of Tsushima, and the picture on the right is several years later, once she's in full Japanese service as Iwami. Now, the Oyol, as designed, its secondary and tertiary battery was... Um, a set of twin six-inch gun turrets, fairly high up in the ship, and then lower down um, deck-ported three-inch guns. Whereas, as you can see on it, on the uh, on her in her Japanese guys, they actually basically took off an entire layer of superstructure, um, one in, one entire deck's worth of superstructure across most of the ship. They made the bridge a bit smaller. They m took down the fighting tops from the masts. Um, they shortened the funnels slightly and actually heightened the masts as well. They completely removed the secondary and tertiary batteries as had been put in by the Russians. So the twin six inch turrets went, um, all the three inch positions were plated over. And instead at the um, at the one, one deck lower down, as you can see, there were some casement or yeah, effectively, as you might as well call them, casement-mounted six-inch, uh, eight-inch guns. Sorry, installed. So it still had a secondary battery, but it was half the number of guns, um, three per side instead of six per side, but two inches larger caliber and lower down, which increased the ship's stability and reduced displacement. So overall, the ship's displacement went down quite a bit. Um, as built, it was about I think about six, seven hundred tons taken off of the overall displacement which obviously made it a bit more efficient as well. Um, there were some light weapons put in to replace the tertiary battery, but they definitely weren't hull-mounted. They were placed higher up in the vessel. So, yeah, that, those are the main changes. I mean, she got her machinery completely rebuilt. Obviously, the hull was repaired. 
um, various other changes. But yeah, it was it was a pretty much a comprehensive uh, re. I wouldn't call it a modernization because oil was pretty new, but it was definitely a comprehensive rebuild. Trey Atkins asks, uh, please give a breakdown of command structure at the Admiral level, such as Fleet Commander, Theater Commander, etc., with examples of good and bad performance at each level. Unfortunately, that's not something I can answer in a dry dock. Um, yeah, the, the many different roles that you can give an Admiral are so varied and so complex, I would have to do that as a Wednesday special. Um, so I'll put that, I'll put that as a a voting section on the Wednesday specials, and especially if you have good and bad examples at each level. Yeah, that'll run into a while. Andronor asks, whilst most of the anti-submarine warfare work in World War II is primarily handled by destroyers or aircraft, were ships like heavy cruisers or battleships equipped with ASDIC or sonar to detect or protect themselves from submarines? Yes, the idea of fitting ASDIC to cruisers actually went back a fair old way. Um, Antrim here, and yes it is suitably old, um, was actually the first cruiser to be fitted with ASDIC way back in the early 1920s, and by the time of the Second World War, after some experience and various experiments, it was rapidly decided that to have all cruisers fitted with ASDIC for self-defence purposes, and so yeah, they were in pretty pretty short order. There were a number of uh, benefits to this, one of which obviously was cruisers could look after themselves, and given how often cruisers had to act independently or in squadrons of like ships, um, this was very important. But the other aspect was on when you're on convoy escort work, when the weather got really bad, like it often did in the North Atlantic or in the Arctic, destroyers being somewhat more lightly built intending to jump around a bit more had to stow their ASDIC or sonar gear depending on which navy you were in to prevent the stuff getting damaged the heavier cruisers could sail around and not suffer this fate um, and so they could actually keep operating in an anti-submarine protection role in weather that the, where the lighter escorts just couldn't uh, as far as the battleships when it was in the late 1930s that it was decided that capital ships such as battleships and carriers should be fitted with it, um, but obviously that's a lot more of an involved process when this ship has already been constructed. I mean, putting uh, a, putting an ASDIC system into a pre-existing cruiser is difficult enough. Um, installing it in a, in a battleship where you need an even larger dry dock to be able to do that, and uh, there tends to be a lot more... Uh, under under the keel uh, structure, torpedo defense, etc., that you need to get through to fit one properly. Well, yeah, it does make things a bit harder. So Long John asks, I don't understand why the Goban and Brest law were in the Mediterranean at the beginning of World War One rather than the Pacific under von Spee or based out of Dar es Salaam to defend German East Africa. Why were they there? So. <laughs> It comes down actually to one relatively simple thing. Imperial Germany, and by which I mean the Kaiser, wanted to play at being a big power on the block at a time when Germany was not, colonially speaking. The purpose of the East Asia Squadron was to defend German possessions in the uh, Western Pacific, but bear in mind that Pretty much the only reason Germany had possessions in the Western Pacific was because the Kaiser wanted some so that he could say that he had an empire. And German holdings in Africa, similarly motivated, but had made a little bit more economic sense than a loose scattering of islands and one odd port that you'd managed to force off of the Chinese. Um, and the next stage of that was, well... Again, the Kaiser was obsessed with being like the British Empire and he looked at the Mediterranean and went... Hmm, the British like the Mediterranean. They have a fleet in the Mediterranean. And him and the Imperial staff went, we should exert our influence in the Mediterranean as well. The fact that they didn't actually have anything in the Mediterranean to guard. Um, I mean, there's minor details. The, the Austro-Hungarians were there, but maybe they needed a bit of a leg up. Who knew? Um so yes, the Goban and Breslau were there basically as present ships to wave the German flag around and say, look at us, we're nice and important and scary, you should you should ally with us. Um, and that's what they were doing pretty much up until 
near enough to the beginning of World War One. There was, in theory, a small window where they might have been able to get Goban back to uh, the High Seas Fleet, but unfortunately Goban was coming to the tail end of her stint in the Mediterranean. They were thinking about replacing her with Moltke, and so her engines, etc., weren't in the best of condition. So when it looked like war was about to break out, the first thing they had to do was um, find a, the nearest friendly port to repair the boilers as much as they could. And by the time that was done, well, war were declared. And then, well, they were stuck, and they had to make a run for it towards the Dardanelles, and the rest, is, as they say, is history. So, so many things about the de the decisions made by Imperial Germany generally and the High Seas Fleet specifically can be boiled down to in the run-up to World War One because the Kaiser wanted it to be that way. And... Uh, if you want me to get into the psychology of Kaiser Wilhelm II, that is one subject I'm not touching with a 30-foot spa torpedo. And now, since we've hit the one-hour mark, it's time for the interlude. Commander Unnamed asks, what do you think would have happened if the relief task forces of Saratoga and Lexington hadn't been delayed and hadn't turned back from Wake Island? Could the forces defending the atoll have been rescued, or would it likely have cost the US both of its Lexington-class carriers? So it's a bit of a coin toss either way, to be perfectly honest. Lexington is probably not at risk because it's doing a diversionary attack, so it's not going to be tied up in the main engagement. If Saratoga's group presses on, then it's going to come down to exactly how the engagement uh, falls out because by the time Saratoga's group gets in, even gets in range to perform some kind of relief effort, the Japanese second wave had arrived, and that would have been obviously Soryu and Hiryu. Now, yeah, this is where it gets complicated because in terms of surface combat power, the US force has three heavy cruisers versus the Japanese two. Um, the Japanese have some older light cruisers and some destroyers. The Americans have uh, slightly better destroyers when it comes to being configured for surface warfare. Um, apart from anything else, they're not being used for a ground invasion, which helps. Um, and of course, like uh, Saratoga has the uh, the wonderful feature of having some eight-inch guns. So, oddly enough, if it gets into a fight. The American forces actually have a slightly better chance if they roll up by surprise and engage in a surface action that's supported by um, Saratoga's air group. If they try and go in for an aerial assault in a more conventional carrier sort of doctrine way to try and relieve the islands, then this runs into some problems because the very beginning of the war like this and with a, an escort of three uh, cruisers and some destroyers Lexington's overall anti-aircraft and fighter defense is not going to stand up to a combined strike from the two Japanese carriers which very well could cost them the, uh, the Saratoga and most of its group however there is also balancing against that whether or not the Japanese realize that the um, Americans are actually present at all. Now, Saratoga does carry enough aircraft that if it shows, if they show up completely out of the blue and get the drop on Soryu or Hiryu or both, they might well do enough damage in that first strike wave to sink or badly damage one or both of the carriers, at which point with the Japanese then on the back foot, potentially a second follow-up strike might finish off the other one, which would be a huge victory for them. But that depends on the Americans finding out where the Japanese are and the Japanese not reciprocating, because as I say, if the Japanese work out where Saratoga is, 
uh, they've definitely got the advantage on that side of things. So there's a reasonable chance that they might be able to relieve the island and or inflict some fairly major damage on the Japanese strike force. But when I say reasonable, as in it's in double-digit percentages, it's not the majority. It's probably maybe a 20-25% 20, chance of pulling that off. The majority chance is that Saratoga is either badly damaged or destroyed um, by the Japanese. Whether or not that's a reciprocal destruction, that much I wouldn't necessarily want to take an estimate on. Because, well, as we see with both Coral Sea and Midway... In these early big carrier engagements, things can go very differently on the flip of a coin. So what the actual outcome would have been would remain unknown, but obviously the Japanese have two flight decks and more aircraft, so theoretically they have the, uh, the, the advantage in that scenario. Matt Blom asks, did fouled hulls due to marine life growth and the consequential effect on speed ever have a decisive effect on a naval engagement in the age of steam? For example, slowing down a ship that could otherwise have escaped an engagement. Yes, actually, in a number of ways. Uh, two of the best examples actually both involve Graf Spee, one the Admiral and one the ship. And the thing is, with the age of steam you've got to take into account that with anti-fouling paints and such if your ship's been at sea long enough for marine growth to, to start fouling the hull over the effects of the anti-fouling paint and you haven't had a chance to stop and clean it you're going to have a number of other issues building up as well uh, including your engines needing maintenance um, possible contaminations of fuel etc etc which are also going to slow you down as well as just wear and tear on the machinery so all of these things have to be factored in but as a general rule of thumb on a large capital ship for the first second world war period fouling if it got really bad could knock two or three knots off of your top speed and that's just on its own let alone the effects of machinery um, and say machinery fuel wear and tear etc so in both cases of uh, battles involving somebody called Graf Spee, in the Battle of the Falkland Islands in World War I, whilst Scharnhorst and Nisenor were not as fast as the two battlecruisers that were chasing them down, the margin of speed, if they'd been fresh out of dock, would have been a lot closer, which may or may not have allowed them to escape. I mean, they would have been run down eventually, but whether or not they would have been able to stay out of gun range long enough to, say, get into the cover of night or just get far enough away quickly enough that it was harder to track them, etc. These kinds of things, they might have stood a marginal chance, but um, as, because of a mixture of mechanical issues as well as the engines, uh, as well as the hull being fouled, they weren't able to do so and likewise when it came to the ship Admiral Graf Spee at the Battle of River Plate by the time Graf Spee showed up to fight uh, Achilles, Ajax and Exeter again its hull was fouled, its speed was reduced which allowed the British ships a little bit more operational space to manoeuvre in because they were faster than Graf Spee anyway but they were at least able to make their maneuvers and get into position a lot quicker and a lot easier and also more easily evade any attempts to close the range at least until Exeter started to get quite battered because of again of the German ship's inability to quite make the same speed that it could have fresh out of dock. John Rees asks how effective were the Luftwaffe's attempts to use level bombers against merchant shipping specifically in reference to the Heinkel 111? Not especially effective to be perfectly honest um, I mean it's the good old spade bomber but um, yeah the problem with the level bombing attempts against any shipping merchant or military was the fact that well the Heinkel 111 is something of a large target so you have two choices really you can either fly at very high altitude and try and level bomb your way to victory from that aspect but a high altitude release for shipping is relatively easy to dodge. I mean, the accuracy is not brilliant in the first place. It's not to say they didn't achieve it. Sometimes they did, but it was more by luck than design. 
there's plenty of accounts from sailors in both, let's say, warships and merchant ships looking up at the sky during high altitude German air attacks and just going, hmm, I can see the bombs. I can see where they're going. I guess we'll just go the other way. And that was that. Occasionally they did guess wrong, especially if the bombs were actually on target for a change. And obviously there's no particular, then if they are roughly on target, there's no real change in apparent angle to give you some idea of which direction you should probably be going. The other option was to come in much lower and you're still doing level bombing. You're not dive bombing with this thing, certainly. Um, but the, they experienced some rather major losses trying that particular avenue of attack because, well, it's one thing to be spraying away at a dive bomber or torpedo bomber that's coming in the, and then breaking off and where that uh, aircraft is somewhat agile. The Heinkel 111 is many things. Agile is not one of them and small definitely isn't another. So it took somebody truly special to miss with even the most rudimentary of anti-aircraft weaponry if this thing came flying in for a low-level air attack. Um, and yeah, that, that caused some rather high casualty figures, which is why actually, amongst other reasons, the Heinkel 111 was withdrawn from general bomb-based anti-shipping attacks in many instances, and a number of them were actually converted to torpedo bombers. And yeah, torpedo bombing Heinkel 111s actually had some rather remarkable successes later on down the line. But at the same time, you've also got to remember this isn't a knock particularly against the Luftwaffe. Nobody was particularly good at level bombing shipping because level bombing shipping from high altitude with unguided bombs just it doesn't really work, especially in World War II. The bomb sites don't have the accuracy. And unless the captain of the ship completely misses what you're doing and you happen to be on target, they can just evade. It's not that difficult. Um, this is why dive bombing and torpedo bombing are the primary striking elements of aircraft carriers. Andrew Anderson asks, not a particularly sexy question, but as I work for them, I'd certainly love to see what you can find out. What was the scope of the Royal Fleet Auxiliary's involvement in operations in World War II? So the Royal Fleet Auxiliary had a rather eclectic role in World War II, the starting off quite small, then going all over the place and eventually ending up with quite a key role. And this was because of the way the British planned to fight wars. Britain going into the war had an extensive network of naval bases and friendly ports, thanks to the fact, well, the British Empire was a thing. And so... In terms of replenishment at sea, they didn't have to worry themselves quite as much as other navies such as the Japanese and all the Americans who were thinking mostly about fighting over vast expanses of the Pacific where there aren't any ports for thousands of miles, let alone friendly ones. So in the run-up to World War II, most of the RFA's duties consisted of shuttling supplies, primarily oil, but other supplies as well, um, to and from the various bases from which Royal Navy ships would, in theory, call in, replenish, refuel, and head back out again. Although there was obviously some work done about replenishment at sea where necessary. Now, as you might expect, for a service that's mainly concerned with point A to point B uh, supply ferrying, the RFA was not particularly large relative to the fleet it was servicing. And so its initial role was relatively minor just trying to keep these things up but as bases fell as the new paradigms of war emerged where you ne wouldn't necessarily want your ships to be static in known dock spaces every so often and as various ships were being sunk both merchant and royal navy the rfa began to expand it needed to supply the fleet at sea more and more often but <laughs> Unfortunately, at the same time, as some of the bigger and faster merchant tankers and such like these sort of very key uh, supply ships that are in were in relatively short supply in the merchant navy started to go down, the strategic planners started to look at the RFA's small fleet of relatively well-equipped tankers and go, hmm, we could probably use those. 
And so just when the RFA was getting set up to go sort of full fleet supply train, it suddenly found its resources being pulled hither and yon by what was not entirely strictly directly naval requirements. It also ended up as a kind of clearinghouse and minor design bureau for various things such as uh, the Victory ships, which were the British and Canadian, etc., built for, uh, well, not versions of, but equivalents to the Liberty ships in the uh, US. And these were actually in large part commissioned into the RFA and then uh, either sold on, loaned on, leased, lent, etc., to merchant concerns. So there was that. So the the RFA was kind of by the by the halfway through with the Second World War was almost as much involved in the merchant and civilian side of the war as it was the fleet resupply and maintenance side of the war. Now, as the war progressed and the U-boat menace was gradually broken and the German surface fleet became less and less of a concern, you start to see the RFA transitioning back more towards what it had originally envisaged doing earlier in the war and on a much larger scale. So by the time you roll around to sort of 44, 45 and the British Pacific fleet becomes a thing, then you're now looking at the RFA, as you can see here, doing actual full-on fleet resupply at sea, um, going on a bit of a fast learning curve in that particular respect. And by the time it comes out of the war, then the RFA is a considerably larger element of the Royal Navy's strategic thinking in direct involvement with the fleet compared to what it had been a few years earlier in 1939. And that's basically where you get the the start of the modern RFA. That's where you start to see the need for honestly not hospital ships, um, armament supply, stores, oil etc all of this being taken directly to the fleet at sea and acting in direct support fleet formations this sort of latter part of world war ii is the crucible where those techniques are refined perfected and the need for certain types of shipping identified the hand of ray asks how would you describe the impact of large fast ocean liners such as the queen mary olympic mauritania etc on the great war and world war ii their impact is somewhat varied across the wars when it comes to the first world war a lot of them are relatively quickly taken up into naval service and turned into armed merchant cruisers because well that's what a lot of them had been designed for and a lot of that i've gone over in the uh, video about carmania versus cap trafalgar the armed merchant cruiser video so um, take a look at that if you if you want to know more about that part but Unfortunately, it turns out that these really big, really fast ships burn an awful lot of fuel, and so very quickly into the First World War, when it came to the bigger, faster ones, the Admiralty took a look at the, uh, the fuel bill and went, it cost how much? Um, and very quickly returned them back to normal civilian ownership to do other things, or in some cases converted them to uses that didn't involve them charging around a the mid-twenties of knots for extended periods of time. And it was in this shift over to other uses that you see a lot of them put to use in the mid to latter part of the Second World War, uh, First World War, sorry. So this is where Britannic, um, which is, of course, Titanic's sister ship, is being used as a hospital ship, gets sunk. Uh, Lusitania is being used as, well, let's not get into the debate about what it was actually carrying, but... It's being used as a transport of one sort or another, get sunk. Um, some of the others are used as troop ships and other uh, kinds of transports, which obviously they're very good at. Um, they don't get sunk, by and large. But what, one of the things, especially in the First World War, that's thought is that these big, fast ships are actually big enough and fast enough that they don't need to travel with convoys or even with much of, if any, escort, because it's thought that they can outrun submarines and just make it non-viable for the submarines to chase them or track them. Obviously, it doesn't quite work out in Lusitania's case, but there you go. And in the Second World War, they have a much clearer idea of what these ships are useful for, and that is basically transports, troop transport specifically. So a lot of the bigger ships, you do get one or two that are you repurposed for other things occasionally, like the odd hospital ship or whatever, but mostly 
the big liners in the Second World War are used as mass troop conveyors, um, going all sort all over the place, really. And to be fair, in that role, they actually have a reasonably decent effect because the number of ships you'd need to move the several thousand troops that these things can can shift and the speed that they can shift them at is it's quite a saving actually and when you, i mean when you can bring over most of a division on a single ship that's um well it's a cause for a few sleepless nights in case one of the things gets torpedoed but if it works it it's fantastic so yeah there's there's a certain unsung hero aspect in in that respect the build up of troops in the uk and then the supply of troops to europe and indeed all over the place elsewhere and then getting them back home again afterwards would have been a very much more difficult and drawn out if it hadn't been for a core of large fast liners that were motoring on back and forth carrying out these roles Nikolai Flo asks, why were bursting charges on large naval shells so relatively small? Now, I vaguely recall answering something along the lines of this relatively recently, so I won't go into too much depth this time. But anyway, it comes down to how strong you need the shell to be. As you can see here, the shell is actually made up of several discrete components um, in terms of just sheer size. And then on top of that, uh, there's there's other bits internally. But what it comes down to in the end is that you're firing something, if you're talking about large battleship shells, something that weighs in the order of 2,000 pounds or about a tonne, give or take, depending on exactly what caliber gun you're using and whose nation you're in. And obviously with a super heavy 16 inch, even more so. And the Japanese 18.1s. And that's quite heavy. It's being flung at incredible speed and it's hit, hitting, at least if everything's going to plan, something pretty solid, i.e. armour on a ship, whilst travelling at that very high speed, which means that whether it just crashes up against the armour or if it punches through, either way there's going to be some fairly significant forces involved slowing it down, whether that be partially or completely. And um, yeah, if you're if you're going to be firing a shell to do that kind of job, it's got to hold together during that process at least long enough to ideally penetrate through into the ship and then detonate. If you start building a nice hollow chamber full of something that's not as solid as steel, like say a, a chamber full of explosive then you're introducing a structural weakness, which means that the walls of the shell are thinner, there's fewer spaces to place things like your fuse, etc. And there's a much greater chance of the shell just shattering on impact. And this is why high explosive shells, basic, apart from the fact that well, they're fused to detonate on contact, but even if they weren't, this is why um, high explosive shells will tend to just kind of smear themselves over a uh, ship's armor plate. They've got a lot of explosive power, but the the shell just isn't capable of standing up to the impact forces. So when it comes to large armor-piercing naval shells, they've they've got to have a, a form that is largely solid in order for them to deliver their payload. Once they've delivered their payload, obviously you want the biggest bang for your buck that you can get, but depending on the design of shell, that's not going to be too much and relatively speaking could be quite quite little <laughs> i mean at the same time 20 kilos of explosive is still a heck of a bang um and uh various variants thereof depending on which particular shell you're using but yeah if you're firing something that weighs over a ton you might think that enough explosive that one person could reasonably carry it around in on under one arm maybe isn't that much to show for it but as i say the simple fact is any any much larger and you just have the shell break up on impact at which point it's not really much use to anybody because if you've got a hundred kilo bursting charge and you have that go off outside the ship it's probably it's going to have even less effect than if you just flung an he shell with three times as much explosive at them the interesting thing is the British did actually try this idea with the CPC shell, 
um, in the run up to World War One, which operated on the principle that, well, naval guns are so powerful, we can sacrifice some of this penetration capability in exchange for a larger warhead to do more damage. And in theory, that would have worked fantastically as long as you were only shooting at armoured cruisers um, and the bow, stern and superstructure of battleships. But the armour on battleships rapidly grew and obviously with the advances in steel as well rapidly became impenetrable to cpc shells so yeah i say whilst they would have been absolutely wonderful for fighting lightly armored targets the fact of the matter is if you're using battleship grade guns you're probably fighting heavily armored targets at which point you just go back to the regular ap clayton gorday asks say in 1917 congress decides that one massive investment is better than many smaller ones and actually proves the construction of a class of four of the Tillman 42 battleships before the Washington Treaty is finalised. How effective would they have been as long-term assets with relevant upgrades in World War II, and how would other major naval powers try to compete or counter these maximum battleships? Well, <laughs> if they'd somehow managed to get that going, the Washington Treaty, as we know, it wouldn't have happened. There's... How do you account for these things within something like the framework of the Washington Treaty? No one else had any interest in even attempting to build something this size. Um, the Washington Treaty, for it to work at all, would basically have had to have said, right, well, whatever the tonnage of the Tillmans adds up to, Japan and Britain can build any ships they like of any size, dimension, armour, weight, etc., gunpowder they like, up to this tonnage and then we're all going to follow rules that are going to seem absurdly tiny and pathetic in comparison to what they've just built but never mind so yeah all of that aside to be perfectly honest they would not have been tremendously useful in world war ii and that's for two reasons one they're so massive that at the time Getting them in to do modernizations is well. One would be insanely expensive, and two, I, I have doubts you'd even be able to sensibly do so. <laughs> I'd love to see. Uh, I'd love to see someone come up with a dry dock uh, that was available in the nineteen twenties USA, capable of actually holding one of these things once it was fully completed. Um, and even if there was one, I rather suspect they'd be very few and far between, and needed for other things. But anyway. Um, even if these things are built, the, the main problem is speed. The standard class battleships, for all their strengths, weaknesses, and the fact that a bunch of them got blasted apart Pearl Harbor, their single biggest weakness is pretty much the same thing that the R class faced um, in World War II. They're just too slow for modern fleet operations. Y you can use them as backstops, you can use them as shore bombardment, you can use them as convoy escort, you can use them as line defense if someone's coming for you and to be fair, this kind of thing would probably mess up a Yamato pretty nicely, although quite what form the Yamatos would take if the uh, the <laughs> the Japanese knew these things were around, I, I don't even want to think about. Um, but yeah, their main thing is they're big and they're slow, which would make them horribly vulnerable uh, targets for submarines and especially aircraft. They can't do carrier escort, they can't... Um, meaningfully sail away from whatever unholy combinations of shipping the Japanese had come up with in response to them. They're, they're basically the world's most expensive shore bombardment ships by the time of World War II, unfortunately. Um, unless you wanted to go completely berserk and, let's say, find some kind of gigantic dockyard, strip it all down, spend about as much as you'd spend on a small squadron of other battleships to completely refit it in the late 1930s with technology, engine technology, to get it to go reasonably quickly. Robert Henry Ilston asks, In the Wednesday special on Age of Sail cannon types, you mentioned how certain heavier cannon were used for close-range attacks while others had longer ranges but with lighter projectile weights. Did any of the naval powers of the day develop a doctrine for using more long-range guns paired with chain or bar shot to disable a vessel and then go in for the kill versus focusing on shorter range but harder hitting heavier cannon and just tr trust that the toughness of their vessel and the sailing skill of captain and crew? Or was it more a ship or ship and captain basis? In the time period that was covered in that particular video, to be honest, naval guns were 
just about coming into accepted and widespread use so really fancy fleet-wide tactics in as much as a fleet-wide was even a thing didn't really exist it the ships were so weird and wonderful and different to each other that you basically built the armament for the ship in particular or occasionally you might build a ship around a certain type of armament and again bear in mind that the vast majority of these guns were anti-personnel weapons there were relatively few anti-shipping weapons on a late 14th 15th 16th century uh, warship as compared to what you might think you'd see in the classic age of sail a bit further down the line and uh, the same thing with shot there was a lot of different types of anti-personnel shot but when it came to the kinds of specialist shot that you'd use against different parts of the ship again this was more heavily developed in the slightly later period in the 17th 18th centuries so yeah occasionally you'd have ship you might see ships that were rigged in certain ways um for certain purposes but that would be yeah that would be very much on a well we particularly designed this ship to see if this would work or the captain has decided that he wants this armament on his ship and and seeing how that all went cost is another factor as well because um the bigger heavier guns whether that's the the big long bronze culverins or the slightly shorter heavy iron cannons they're rarer they cost a lot more and yet they also have slightly more um impressive results if they go boom so you see a lot of minion sakers falcons etc and their various derivatives because well they're smaller easier to handle and you can get more of them on a ship and since again they're still thinking in primarily anti-personnel pur um, purposes the this is more attractive than spending all your money on a half dozen culverins or cannons which are going also going to be slower to reload manani wanderer asks which warships and classes of warships had the best and worst kill to death ratios from the age of steam onwards this is actually a really difficult one to answer it's it, depending on how you count things because if you're looking at overall which classes of ships sunk the most other um ships it's going to be submarines um basically it's the first second third fourth etc 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 all the way down places going to be occupied by submarines now fair enough most of their kills against helpless merchant ships but still it's kill is kill um the only slight problem you have there is that obviously almost all submarine classes that were involved in racking up those numbers of kills also tended to take relatively significant hull casualties as well i suspect that if you were going to dig down through that you'd probably find that probably something of one of the u.s uh, world war ii fleet submarine classes would probably fill that category because obviously they weren't although they did suffer casualties and losses against the japanese they weren't suffering them at anywhere near the rate of the kriegsmarine uh, and its u-boat corps so although the u-boat corps would almost certainly be miles ahead on ultimate kills if you average that out and kill death i suspect that the u.s one of the u.s subclasses would probably come out on top in that respect if you exclude submarines um again you still have a problem of some classes are just produced in vast numbers and others aren't so something like the fletchers for example um a number of fletchers are lost but they're just so many of them they're gonna have a lot of kills between them whereas any kind of battleship or most cruiser classes they're just not produced in the numbers and they don't see enough actions to to rack up the number of kills that they'd need to get anywhere close to the, the board i mean the queen elizabeth class probably has a decent shot at things um but that's almost entirely down to war spite and that in and of itself is almost entirely down to uh the the second battle of narvik because for a battleship war spite has a ridiculously long kill tally i mean it gets a bunch of damages and assist, possible assists at jutland and so forth but um if you add up the number of destroyers it takes out plus obviously cruisers sunk at matapan etc warspite has a very long kill tally and end of the queen elizabeth so they only lose barham 
so that's probably a fairly positive one whereas if you look at other things uh like well um something like you say renown or repulse um they they take 50 percent losses because repulse gets sunk and renown doesn't manage to rack up quite the same kind of kill count that war spite does and so on and so forth and then yeah so it, it's very difficult to quantify that kind of thing it would require a very very in-depth scenario to come up with precise figures um Im Im imagining trying to tally every single kill and every single hull loss on something like the Fletcher class or the Wix Clemson class or any of the other destroyer classes that were produced in mass numbers, uh, it would take a while. Thomas Farley asks, you refer to the T-class submarine and state its standout feature to be a forward spread of 10 torpedoes, but is this such a significant feature when the T-class only carries 16 torpedoes in total, as in not enough for a full reload, uh, wouldn't a forward spread of 8 and a total of 16 make more sense? So, to understand the T-class, you have to understand the operational environment they were designed in. They were initially designed in a period where everyone, well, at least the British and some other navies, thought that the whole unrestricted submarine warfare thing that the Germans had pulled off in the First World War would be made illegal under international treaty and therefore you didn't need to design a submarine for long-term underwater commerce ra uh, hunt raiding or merchant ship hunting because that kind of activity would be declared unlawful and if you're not allowed to sink people by surprise and you instead have to surface and use your guns then well then you might as well use small cruisers to do that instead for a more vulnerable submarines so they were looking at developing a submarine for primarily hunting enemy warships which are of course faster and tend to be a bit more agile and a little bit more alert than the average merchant ship on top of that there was the consideration that well the british knew that they were developing asdic and they assumed that everybody else would be developing something similar and given that what they knew of the ranges that this was capable of what we now call sonar they determined that it was relatively unlikely that a submarine that was hunting a warship group would be able to get very close to the warships because theoretically obviously the escorts would be pinging away with their asdic or sonar equivalent and so you'd have to be launching from basically the maximum range of your torpedoes and it doesn't take a rocket scientist to work out that if you are launching effectively dumb fire weapons with a several minute run in time at an extremely long distance against a target that's both fast and able to maneuver and probably looking out for this kind of thing your chances of hitting anything are relatively slim and so the solution was well if we can't hit with one or two or four torpedoes we just need to fire as many torpedoes as possible and something will hit at which point, once we fired it, to be perfectly honest, they're going to come after us, so we don't need to worry about full spread reloads, we just need to get away and have a few in reserve in case we need to follow up. And hence the idea of the 10 Torpedo Salvo was born. Now, the 10 Torpedo Salvo is made up of six forward tubes, and then, as you can see here, two external tubes, external to the pressure hull, so these are basically single-shot weapons, so you can't reload these at sea, just the six internal ones. And then there's also a couple of amidships tubes, which you can't see on this particular T-Class because they've been reconfigured from how they were designed. And these were also single-shot tubes. So although you had 16 torpedoes total, 10 of them were in the tubes, four of those obviously being in the inaccessible tubes that were single-shot only, and then you've got six left over, which is a full reload for your six forward tubes torpedo tubes that you can reload at sea so yeah it's a it's a relatively small torpedo armament for a submarine of this size but it does have quite the heck of a punch if it comes across <laughs> a warship or indeed a merchant convoy uh, it can send an absolutely devastating single salvo and then skedaddle which is basically what they were designed to do his Lordship asks, in the age of steel warships, how common was it to include elements of ship design purely for aesthetic reasons? 
And were there ever instances of ships getting into trouble because of some part of it that was designed for appearance over functionality? So although appearance in terms of prim paint work and such was very much a thing in the late 19th century, major structural elements of warships being designed for aesthetic, not so much. There were, of course, certain uh, concessions to the aesthetic made during the period of relatively speaking peace, uh, such as, as you can see here, the U late 19th century US Navy's trend for rather ornamental bow ornaments. But to be fair, the Age of Sail had spent most of its period with figureheads and figureheads lasted well into the ironclad age. So that's not exactly something you can hold against them. And they did, along with other navies, have a very clear idea of what would happen in wartime. Navies can be pretty darn ruthless when it comes to making sure their ships are ready for war. So these kinds of what I'd call secondary features, where they're not actually part of the overall ship structure, were designed to just be taken off when it came for wartime. So, yeah, in general, warships didn't get into trouble with the few small aesthetic features that they had because they were e they would either be removed as planned in time of ramping hostilities or, worse comes to worse, in general, as best could be done, they'd just be stripped away. There are quite a few tales of various ships in kind of the late 19th, early 20th century, where they end up heading into action, possibly somewhat unexpectedly in the context of their overall voyage. And it's a case of, okay, is that breakable? Is that flammable? Yes. Can we store it below without inconveniencing the rest of the ship? No. Right. Rip it out. Chuck it over the side. Um, people learned the lessons of Tsushima quite well when it came to having easily exposed and unnecessary burnable things on ships. So, um, yeah, there's there's that, I guess. Th th there's a certain element to warships whereby if you design them properly, they look pretty good anyway. So you need relatively small embellishments. And as I say, generally, navies will try and make sure that those embellishments are removable in pretty short order. Bill Cunningham asks, How does a naval officer in the Royal Navy, born a commoner, become a lord? Well, the formula is actually relatively simple. Um, firstly, be born in a time such that when you get to some reasonable level of command in the Royal Navy, there's a war going. So, uh, yeah, not a lot you can do to control that. But this is why uh, a lot of the examples that you'll find are from the uh, 18th and 19th century when the Royal Navy spent uh, the better part of a half a century at war with somebody or other. So it was pretty certain that you'd find somebody who was uh, of command age at the time that a war was getting going at of in somewhere in the world um so yes be born at the right time which uh, which helps you have to be as i say have to have, have to be of command age at the time of war then be hard to hit very important um you can't be made a lord or a knight if you um get shot it, it tends to have rather negative effects on your long-term life expectancy, especially in the 18th and 19th centuries. I mean, if you're like Nelson or someone like that, you might lose an eye or a limb or something uh, equally disposable. But taking a cannonball to the chest tends to shorten your life expectancy rather viciously. And then you have to take into account the third factor, which is you better hope you have the right mi mix of luck and or skill. Because... If you're of the right age and you've got command of a ship or ships and you've managed to not get blasted apart by the enemy, then chances are you're going to wind up in a battle sooner or later, at which point you've just got to be good enough to pull off something really noteworthy. Now, whether that's an individual ship action that everybody in, else in the battle kind of goes, whoa, hang on a minute, that's, that's impressive, um, or you are leading your squadron or fleet to an utterly decisive and crushing victory. And that's basically it. Make your reputation and your path to promotion to higher ranks is near enough guaranteed. And, well, by and large, the Royal Navy and the British establishment don't like their higher ranking admirals to be unentitled, which means that sooner or later, if you if someone can point and say, look, look at this man, he, he defeated so many French ships and Spanish ships and has brought in much prize money. And, and now there's an entire squadron that's made up of ships that he captured. There's precious little excuse not 
to knight you and uh, then you become a sir and then you might get a viscountage or a peerage or some other equally uh, wonderful title which um, this is why Sir John Jervis has been featuring um, during this period because he was okay he wasn't a dirt common person but he was from a non-noble background son of a barrister ended up being the Earl of St Vincent because yeah basically shiny things given out for beating the French repeatedly over the head with cannonballs and of course in the more modern context of the age of steam and steel um, it's usually uh, shiny things given for exploding Germans. Rachel Ann asks which class of 20th century capital ships carriers battleships and battle cruisers do you think were the best value for their owner for battle cruisers it's i think a relatively easy choice because you're left looking at effectively the renowns on the congos all the world war one battle cruisers yes a number of the classes gave good service but they were in and out of service relatively quickly for various reasons and well after that you had yeah, the Congos, the Hood, and the Renowns. No one else really built them, unless kind of you count maybe Dunkirk. But yeah, that's not going to feature high on the list of best value for money, to be perfectly honest. And between the two, well, the Cong having the Congos encouraged the Japanese to think that they had a chance at surface actions. Um, so given what that they were a small part of dragging the Japanese into, I'd say they probably weren't the best value of return on investment for their particular home nation, which by default kind of leaves the renowns because Hood gave a lot of good service in between the wars, but unfortunately, as we know, um, exploded rather annoyingly early in the Second World War, whereas whilst Repulse was lost, um, obviously in part 4 said, renown went on well, it had already got a fair number of impressive actions under its belt by the time Repulse went down, but would go on to become a fairly vital linchpin of the Royal Navy during the Second World War, not including, obviously, all the stuff that it did in the interim in peacetime, uh, helping to shore up the British Empire. So for battle cruisers, best return on investment, I think definitely the renown. Renown specifically, but renown class generally. For carriers, I'm actually going to go with the Lexington class. Um, it's obviously, it's, it's tempting to go with the Essex class, both for their sheer numbers and their longevity. But to be perfectly honest, the Essex class, a lot of their longevity is out of the front line. And when you talk about capital ships, they are your front line big units. Um, the Essex class overtaken in that role by the mid 50s to a point that I'm sorry but it, they I you couldn't really consider them capital ships um if you're going to go victorian on it maybe second class capital ships by that point but when you if you compare that to the lexingtons the lexingtons teach the US navy how to carry a basically because with the best will in the world langley teaches you that you can carry a lexington teaches them how to actually carry a it also teaches them a lot about how to design carriers, which obviously those lessons then go into designing the Yorktowns, which give you the Enterprise, which uh, is not a bad legacy to have, um, and all the other subsequent classes of carriers that are built in the run-up to and during World War II. They also obviously give good service during the actual Second World War itself. So Lexington obviously lost somewhat early, but Saratoga continues to give good service and keeps coming back almost as much as Enterprise does um, as well. So it's giving it's giving good service throughout that period. It's holding the line, especially when everything else is either sunk or damaged. And yeah, so broadly speaking, for the return on investment that they got out of them, I'd say the Lexington class as frontline capital units probably win the carrier aspect of things. And pretty much the only one with a similar kind of record would be HMS Furious, but unlike Saratoga, Furious was not a frontline combatant for significant parts of the Second World War. 
And for battleships, I'm going to go with the Queen Elizabeth class. That's probably not a great shock to most people. Um, although I would note that this is almost entirely carried by War Spite, to be perfectly honest. Um, I mean, the Queen Elizabeth class as a whole, actually, you can see why they're a good return on investment. They're very capable at the beginning of the First World War. They served through most of the First World War. They obviously have a fairly key part to play at Jutland as part of 5th Battle Squadron. They continue to be numerically the Royal Navy's frontline battleships throughout the interwar period. Obviously Nelson and Rodney exist, but there's only two of them and there's five of the Queen Elizabeths. Going into the war, obviously you have War Spite's career. Does that really need any introduction? Um, Queen Elizabeth and Valiant do a fairly good job of holding the fort in the Mediterranean. Uh, Malaya does a good job of scaring Shan the Shanhorsts. Um, Barham... Barham does a, a a good job for as long as it's around. I suppose you could also say Barham serves as a salutary lesson as to why you don't let submarines get too close to your battleships, but that's possibly being a bit cruel. But overall, just the sheer length of service and some of the strategic points they hold down, as well as War Spite's ridiculous kill ratio and survivability, means you I've probably got to give it to the Queen Elizabeth on that, but as I say, War Spite is really holding the team up there because, yeah, fair enough, Second World War Malaya and Barham are significantly less useful. Now, I know people could argue definitely the Iowa class, but again, the Iowa class, I they're very close, but I personally would knock them out of the running for the same reasons that I knock the Essex class out of the running when you're looking at carriers, which is that we're talking about capital ships, and whilst the Iowas remain technically speaking obviously they're still battleships all the way through to now being museum ships um by shortly after the end of the second world war the battleship is no longer kind of the frontline strategic piece that it was so the capital ship post second world war is very much the aircraft carrier at which point I, I for capital ships specifically i discount it because their their roles in shore bombardment and such like in Korea, Vietnam, etc., and the Gulf War, very definitely useful. Their roles as surface action group leaders in the 1980s, useful. But they're not capital ships at that point, um, in, in the strictest definition of the word. The other ones that I would say become pretty darn close are actually the Colorados, because they get a lot of useful service in the Second World War, certainly once they're rebuilt. Of course, you have... Uh, the Battle of Surigao Strait, for example, showing how capable they are. And they hold the fort as some of the biggest and meanest ship, capital ships during the interwar period. The Basically, the only reason the Colorados don't pull equal or possibly ahead of the Queen Elizabeths is because they're built after the First World War, so they don't have that additional bit of usefulness in, the, in wartime service in the First World War that the Queen Elizabeths do. And that's... This is basically the thing that puts the Queen Elizabeth generally above everybody else is that they serve with distinction on frontline roles through two entire world wars. Um, nobody else, nobody else really does. So, um, oh well, there you go. Wesley Johnson asks, do you know anyone who produces videos such as yours, but for merchant or commercial shipping and or have you considered expanding into fleet auxiliaries such as oilers, replen fleet replenishment vessels, fleet tugs, etc.? Honestly, no, um, I don't. <laughs> I don't know anyone who does the merchant commercial shippings in a manner similar to my own. Um, if anybody does know someone who does that, then uh, yeah, feel free to leave a comment below Point, pointless in that direction um have i considered expanding into fleet auxiliaries kind of they they if it's a fleet auxiliary sort of rfa uh, supply, uh, supply etc i will cover them at some point it's just that well five minute guides are done in chronological order and of request so that's why they're a little bit haphazard and all over the place and people just haven't requested that many fleet auxiliaries yet um, or if they have, they're far, far, far down the list. So uh, it's just a matter of time, I guess. Paul from Chicago asks, can you compare the Trent affair to the Osama Maru incident? Okay, so briefly, for those of you who may not be familiar with it, the Trent affair was an incident that about as close as anything else came 
close to pushing the British Empire into war with the Union during the American Civil War. And oh, well, obviously it didn't happen, but it resulted from a US ship stopping a British a vessel that was, t- amongst other things, uh, conveying two passengers who the Confederate States had designated as diplomats in an ongoing effort to try and get their... Um, well, the the Confederacy re- uh, recognised as a independent, legitimate nation. I get diplomatic recognition. Uh, the frigate stopped the ship, sent a boarding party aboard, removed the two uh, Confederate diplomats, and sailed away. With the Asama Maru incident, this was a case in World War Two before the Japanese declared war, where a number of German crewmen who had been on a German ship that the Royal Navy had tried to stop, um, they'd scuttled their ship, they'd been rescued by a then neutral US cruiser, and then taken passage aboard a Japanese ship to try and get away, and a Royal Navy cruiser rolled up, fired a warning shot, stopped the, um, stopped the, the merchant ship at the Asama Maru, and again, removed the Germans as prisoners. In both cases, this did cause something of a diplomatic incident uh, because of the violation of neutrality, and in both cases it was resolved without war breaking out between the uh, countries in question, at least as a result of that particular incident, although obviously Japan did end up at war with the UK shortly thereafter for completely separate reasons. Now, viewed in sort of generalities, as we've just done, it the incidents do seem similar. However, there are a few subtle differences. In both cases, it, you can make a legitimate argument that the seizures were illegal, and indeed, in both cases, um, some in some of the prisoners were released. In the Trent case, well, there were only two prisoners, and both of them were released. In the Asama Maru incident, some of the German prisoners were released, others were kept hold of. However, um, when it comes to the details, the, the differences are that basically with the Asama Maru incident, the obviously the Japanese ship is neutral, that's, that's no different. However, the German crews aboard were from a German vessel, and Britain was at war with Germany, so they were clearly on opposite sides. The German crew had scuttled their vessel rather than surrender it to a Royal Navy uh, ship, which, whilst it didn't make the members of the Kriegsmarine, was definitely a hostile action. And so there was not necessarily a full case, but there was a certain amount of case to be made that the the Germans constituted the enemy in some way, shape or form. And Germany was a recognised country that Britain was at war with, and so the cruiser did have at least the right to seize or stop a neutral ship to examine it for war contraband, whether or not enemy crewmen be they merchant or Kriegsmarine account as war contraband um, is pretty much the whole reason there's a massive argument over it. Um, With the Trent affair, again, it follows a similar kind of principle in that the Union frigate stops the Trent and removes the two Union, uh, the two Confederate diplomats as supposed war contraband. However, there's a little bit of double think going on in at this particular point because well again the uh, confederate diplomats are not uh members of the confederate navy or whatever so they're not directly belligerent however the main thing is that the confederacy obviously was trying to get diplomatic recognition the union didn't want that the union wanted to view this as purely an internal affair the last thing they wanted was for other countries to recognize the confederate states as a completely separate political entity and nation in and of itself but this opens up a rather interesting legalistic can of worms because if the confederacy is not an independent state they're not a separate organization and therefore the Union is not acknowledging that they are at war with anybody, 
which they weren't. They were they were refusing at this point to eat, say that there was a state of war in existence. Then that meant that legally speaking, their ships didn't have the right to stop neutral shipping in any way, shape or form to examine them for contraband of war, whether or not people counted as contraband. And again, this was a whole argument that basically came down to, no, they probably don't. But you the 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 a warship can only have those rights to stop a, a neutral ship to examine for contraband of war if there is a war and if they are on one side or the other of that war at which point they're classed as belligerents and they have certain belligerent rights um <laughs> which is a wonderful term the thing is if you deny that a war has is even going on you therefore cannot have the rights of a a belligerent at war, <laughs> which then means you actually technically don't have the right to stop anybody, because um, you can't examine something for contraband of war if there's no war, obviously. Um, I think I've made that point enough times already, but yes, yeah, so that's that's the subtle difference in that the, the Union was trying to claim belligerent rights whilst at the same time insisting that the status that would allow them to claim belligerent rights didn't actually exist, which put them on a weaker footing when it came to the legal interpretations of what exactly was going on as compared to the Osama Maru incident. Although, as I said, in both cases, it was adjudged to be a violation of neutrality and some or all prisoners were released as a result of it. The The main difference, obviously, being whether or not the ship that stopped the neutral vessel was a belligerent in the first place and so overall that puts the union legally speaking at a slightly uh in a slightly more difficult position than it put the the british cruiser but the both were playing a little bit fast and loose with international law although obviously um the the differences in the the details that we've just gone over meant that the union ended up technically disavowing the actions of the uh, U.S. frigate, whereas the British never actually disavowed the actions of their cruiser. They just said that effectively, yeah, sorry about that. And also, um, one or two of these people might we might probably shouldn't have taken off the ship. So here you can have them back. Well, that's two hours down. Time for another short interlude. Sweet 420 Dan asks, are there any warships that could have won the blue ribbon from contemporary ocean liners, and what would be the first warship to theoretically be able to hold it? So the blue ribbon is, well, it's technically unofficial, but basically it's the it's the accolade you get if you're the fastest ocean liner to cross the Atlantic. Now, the main reason that warships would have problems getting this award i mean obviously it's awarded to ocean liners anyway so let's assume for a second that warships are allowed to take part um the main problem is fuel because ocean liners and such they're they're big they displace a lot often a lot more than many contemporary warships but because they don't have to worry about things like guns and armor and all that kind of thing things they can devote a lot more space to passengers and fuel which means that even with the relatively inefficient engines you have in the 19th century they can run for considerable time because they've got a lot of fuel on board so they can run full speed near enough full speed for long distances across the atlantic and once you get more efficient uh, engines and such like developed in the 20th century they can obviously run the atlantic and maintain some seriously high speeds now once you get into the thing yeah once you get into the latter part of the 1930s i don't think there's any warships really capable of winning it because the speeds drift north of 30 knots which 
is pretty darn quick. I mean, there's relatively few warships that can make that speed and have anything close to the endurance to be able to make a full transatlantic crossing at that kind of speed. Um, certainly once the, the last one of the United States does it, pushing nearly 35 knots. I'm sorry, but pr practically any warship capable of 35 knots doesn't have the, the, the unrefueled range to make that crossing at, at that speed. Um, but anyway, in, in the mid to mostly the latter part of the 19th century, warships being still running under sort of mostly sail and steam, except for some, um, and the, the non-sail powered ones don't have, again, don't have the range or indeed probably the speed to, to do a full power transatlantic crossing because of the issues we mentioned earlier. Um, I think the the period in which warships could have won the Blue Ribbon if they're allowed to compete would probably be from the 1890s through to the mid-1930s because at that point the speeds for it are in the high teens and the 20s of knots which are speeds that warship contemporary large warships of the time can exceed and the warships that can exceed them do have the range to just about pull it off so you'd be looking at the large larger protected cruisers and some of the larger armored cruisers in the 1890s and 1900s and then in the from the mid to late 1900s through to the mid 1930s you'd be looking at battle cruisers those ships would have the range and the speed to outpace the merchant shipping uh, and manage to make it all the way across the Atlantic without running out of fuel. Cru smaller cruisers, um, in both cases, probably could maybe pull it off, but they'd they'd be pushing up against the fuel margins a lot closer. The the amount of range that a large that a warship has when it's running at full speed drops off very very quickly. So you need something with an awful lot of uh, fuel bunkerage. Andrew Dederer asks, is there any study out there about high in the ship flooding? Um, he asks because of Kirishima, Congo and Shinano all sank due to flooding damage above the engine rooms leading to a loss of stability. I'm not aware of any particular study done in, I guess, peacetime looking at specifically high in the ship flooding and how to cause it. But the principle of the problems that this could cause was actually relatively well known in various circles. And it is elaborated on tangentially or possibly direct and also directly in a number of articles and design studies, etc. Albeit not as I say, not as a specific, like we're going to study exactly how to cause this. Um, now, obviously, the problem, as you mentioned, is that if you flood the ship higher up, the dis well the displacement of the water that floods in is going to be the the same because you've blown a big hole in the side of the ship but you're going to end up with a big heavy mass uh, i.e. the water higher up in the vessel which and as we've discussed many many times the higher up you put a weight the more effect it has on a ship's stability so yeah the same amount of weight that you might be able to say put into the ship's engine rooms or somewhere else lower down in the ship that would simply cause the ship to settle so far in the water higher up especially if it's over on one side could cause the ship to capsize even if that increase in displacement wouldn't otherwise be able to actually cause the vessel to sink just by making its displacement greater than its buoyancy now there there are various incidents that reflect these kinds of problems as well both in terms of direct damage and in terms of progressive flooding. So when protected cruisers were designed, this was an ongoing concern because obviously the protected cruiser has this sort of turtle back armoured protected deck and it's therefore possible for flooding to come in above it, which would destabilise the ship and potentially roll it over, which, amongst other things, influenced exactly how these decks were designed. The Lutzau, or Lutzo, when it went down the German battlecruiser in World War One, part of its problem was that uh, due to damage it had suffered 
higher up in the ship to the bat particularly to the bows from various shell hits when the hits from invincible cause the torpedo rooms to flood and obviously start dragging the bow down it meant the water could flood in through these uh, holes that have been blown in the front of the ship and all this water sat above the armoured deck that's flooding relatively speaking structurally high in the ship which uh, definitely didn't help in terms of uh, its, its sinking and it was also a known weakness in Bismarck's armour design because again low armoured deck once flooding begins if people start poking holes higher up in the ship and water floods in then you get a lot of water sitting high up in the ship's overall structure which actually causes a list that's a lot more significant than it would be if that same amount of water was flooding in lower down. Um, there's also various other cases like say even with the um, USS Franklin. USS Franklin at one point was in a relatively relatively high risk of of capsize and sinking not because of the well in this particular case that we're talking about not necessarily the damage that it had taken but all the water that had been pumped into and onto it to fight the fires which was all collecting high up in the ship um, and that was threatening the ship's stability although um, fortunately as it percolated further down into the ship and off the ship um, that situation was gradually recovered so both from a naval architectural view and also from the view of ship's captains who would know where the worst places to take damage and flooding were, it was a known quantity. As I say, I'm not necessarily sure there was ever a direct study about how to specifically cause this kind of damage, uh, because to be perfectly honest, apart from anything else, um, the accuracy of weapons in the First and Second World Wars was more a case of, well, we hit something, this is good, we'll worry about the details later. Um, but certainly if you were a, a submarine captain and you were thinking about how to set your torpedoes to run, then, yeah, consultation with other captains, you might come up with the idea of trying to cause the flooding higher up in the ship. Now, the, the only real problem with that is that if you're taking on big heavily armoured targets and you set your torpedo to run shallow there's a relatively good chance it's going to hit the upper part of the torpedo defence system and the lower part of the belt and the ship's going to be fairly capable of resisting the impact at that point this is why you want to try and run deep if you can but obviously if the ship's not particularly well protected in the first place um, relative to the weapon you're pointing at it then by all means go for it Cypher asks You've mentioned a few ships that had issues with recoil and muzzle flash from their main guns. Besides the large recoil damping mechanisms behind the gun itself, was there any substantial or particularly laughable attempts at other recoil mitigation or flash suppression? So the problem of recoil, I mean, it's been an issue as long as naval guns have been a thing. So by the time you get to the late 19th and early 20th centuries, the principles behind it are fairly well understood which means that when things go wrong, when you're trying to deal with recoil and, and such like, it usually means somebody somewhere has messed up, not that they have kind of... It's not, I, it's not something that they can't possibly have foreseen, it's something they should have foreseen and just for whatever reason didn't. Usually it's to do with economy measures, whether that's financial or because they're desperately trying to eke every last ton out of the design to comply with a treaty restriction but one way or another if someone starts eating into the strength or scale of the recoil damping mechanisms etc that are present then you end up with some rather severe problems um, some italian cruisers had this problem where they built their recoil uh, mechanisms too light and the gun was effectively and threatening to just well a cause some rather nasty shock damage to the rest of the turret and b also bounced just clean out which is not necessarily a good thing so that to reduce the charges and the weight of shell until eventually someone could try and uh, fix that obviously the nelson class is infamous for the initial problems they had with their guns which were in large part down to the mountings being built too lightly compared to the original design that had been developed for the g3 class again to try and shave tonnage off to fit everything within the Washington Treaty limits 
Um, the other thing to take into account is that recoil for a given gun would vary depending on the ship. So just because a ship, ha two different ships carry the same gun doesn't necessarily mean their mountings are going to be the same. Because efficiency wise, it's better to stop the gun as soon as possible. Um, because then you can have a smaller, either a smaller, tighter mounting, or you can have the same size mounting with more operational space. And obviously this, this is preferable, but the quicker you stop the recoil, the, I mean, the amount of force that's used to stop the, the gun is the same, but it's being enacted over a shorter period of time. So the shock to the rest of the ship's structure as a result of firing the gun is greater if you if you stop the thing entirely i mean this is kind of thing it's like if you just built a really really heavy mount that had no recoil damping in whatsoever and just held the gun in place yeah you the gun would never move but the amount of force that would be transmitted suddenly to the rest of the ship's structure would be immense it would probably just tear itself off off of the mounting or sooner or later it would do that so yeah so on destroyers for example even if they're carrying the same gun um in the US a five inch gun, in the UK maybe a four and a half, you'll find that the, the recoil length on most destroyer guns is actually considerably longer than the recoil length of exactly the same gun when it's fitted to a cruiser or a battleship, because on a cruiser or a battleship the sh ship's structure is strong enough to accept that shock and then obviously take advantage of the shorter recoil, whereas on a destroyer it's usually not the case, so you want a longer stroke on your recoil to, to be able to um, sort that out. And this is the other thing, where it's not economy measures, messing up that particular sliding scale is also where you sometimes see some rather interesting recoil issues. This is also why all other issues, such as increased armour protection aside, Mounts on battleships for secondary and anti-aircraft and dual-purpose weaponry tend to be slightly heavier because they've got to build the recoil structures heavier to absorb the force of the recoil in a shorter distance to gain those other advantages. Federico Bozzi asks, In naval gunnery, could you make a ranking of the best, by your definition or criteria, three long-range near-misses in World War II? So if I was going to pick a top three, I would probably pick two that would fairly comfortably take the crown of longest range naval hit in history had they hit. And the third one would be potentially not so much, not quite as long range as the other two potentially, but definitely much more of a game changer. So the two long range near misses I would pick would be the Iowa's engaging I believe it's Japanese destroyer in the latter part of the Second World War. They obtained a number of straddles but didn't hit anything. Um, that would definitely be in up there. Then you've also got, in theory, Yamato possibly hitting, or not hitting, but damaging White Plains with a near miss. That one, I mean, if it's actually true, would by far and away be if it would be by far and away the longest range naval hit in history um had the shell actually hit um it didn't so whatever whatever i know there is a there's a bit of a debate as to whether or not that shell actually was from yamato there's a fair bit of evidence reasonably produced that says it was there's also some relatively strong counter arguments that say it wasn't and it was from another ship that was closer in um that's not a debate i'm going to get into here because yeah that would take far too long however the assuming that that did the assuming it was from yamato then obviously that would be a, a very long range near miss um the other one would be at the Battle of Cape Spartivento, or as it Teluada, Teluada, I don't know. Um, apparently the Italians call it something different. Uh, but at that point, Vittorio Veneto, as can be seen above, engaged a number of British cruisers at pretty long range, 27,000-ish yards plus, and scored a number of straddles, but again, no, no direct hits. That was probably one of one of the longest range near misses that 
had the potential to actually change things. Because let's face it, at the end of the day, if Yamato had blown away White Plains, would it have changed the outcome of the Battle of Samar all that much? Not really. Uh, similarly, whether or not the eye was managed to kill that particular Japanese destroyer was not going to massively affect the outcome of the Pacific campaign at that point. But if the Italian shell and charge quality issues had been addressed, and this this is an issue that crops up in a number of different battles, but this one very particularly, if Vittorio Veneto had been able to use its superb fire control systems to drop accurate gunfire on the ships, and bear in mind that they had the range, they were straddling, it's just the guns had the spread of a shotgun, and a meme shotgun at that. Bear in mind, obviously, actually, shotguns don't have that much of dispersion before the gun nuts come after me, but never mind. Um, so, yes, if they'd managed to hit some of those British cruisers, that could have had a major effect, both in the fact that they would have come out of that particular battle ahead on kills, and also that it would have denied the British a number of very valuable cruisers at a time they really couldn't afford to not be having cruisers. So, yeah, that's probably potentially the most game-changing one. Not that it necessarily would have changed the overall outcome of the war, but it certainly would have had a rather major effect on the outcome of the Mediterranean naval conflict for a while. Corvus asks two questions, both flag-related, and I'm going to allow this particular one. Um, what was the original purpose of flying a jack? It would seem that by the time you've sailed into a port and dropped anchor or tied up at the dock, people already know who you represented. And how does an extra flag at the bow, not necessarily one that looks like your national ensign, help? And the second part is, what do submarines do about the need for a commissioning pennant? Well, the answer for submarines is, well, they still use a commissioning pennant, as witnessed here. <laughs> it may be one of the few things that's actually above the waterline, but they'll still have one. And uh, just make sure to bring it in afterwards. There's usually something pointy associated with the submarine sail that you can fly a commissioning pennant from, even if it's for a short period of time. Um, now, as far as the having your jack or your fla other flags in port, it comes from a number of for a number of reasons. Firstly, that way back, distinguishing ships was actually very difficult. Um, a ship was a ship was a ship without a flag you couldn't really tell who was who. And this isn't just about warships, it was about merchant ships. Uh, when you're back in sort of the 15th, 16th, even as late as some of the 17th centuries, what constitutes a warship and what constitutes a merchant ship is something of a blurred line. So if you are looking at a port and you can see several dozen ships, at first glance, it'll be very difficult to tell who's a warship, who's a merchant ship, and who does who belongs to which nation. So you still, even in port, need these identifiers up. And apart from anything else, there's various issues such as, well, this ship might look the same as this ship, and they might both be from the same nation. But if ship A is a merchant ship, then the port authorities have certain rights and privileges to aboard and inspect it, etc. If ship B is a warship... Uh, a lot of those rights are somewhat more curtailed, and it's useful to have a flag up there so that you can work things out before potential accidental boarding incidents and gunfire and screaming, etc. So, yeah, this is why warships tend to identify themselves. Even once the distinction between warship and merchant ship becomes a bit clearer, um, in the age of sail, both because of certain commonalities of design and also because... Lots of different navies, to be fair, mainly the Royal Navy made a habit of nicking everybody else's warships. You couldn't really point to a specific national design characteristic and say, well, that means this ship is very definitely in service of this power. Um, so apart from the similarities, the fact that people were capturing each other's ships rendered that point moot. You could make a broad generalisation, but if, say, the French show up with the Berwick or the Americans show up with the Macedonian or the British show up with half of their fleet uh, you're going to go oh well this is clearly a product of uh, this particular nation's docks but it's actually in service of a completely different nation so yeah you, you still need flags to identify that because not everybody was present when the ship sailed in to work out who, who belongs to to what uh, nation and the last part is that warships are considered to be 
effectively little mobile patches of sovereign territory, and you need a flag to signify that. Without that flag, bearing in mind that there is a whole um, set of etiquette regarding the display of flags, if you're not flying any flag, or obviously if you're flying a white flag, this could indicate some kind of surrender or submission, etc. And that's not something you want to do with a piece of what's effectively your nation that just happens to be floating in someone else's harbour. So you, you always keep a flag flying unless there's some other part of the etiquette demands otherwise. There are, of course, also courtesy flags, which you might fly in another nation's port to acknowledge that you, you respect your host nation. So this is why you can sometimes have uh, a ship that might be flying multiple different flags. It might be flying the ensign of the navy that it's in. It might be fly then also be flying the national flag of the nation that it belongs to, which will be quite often two different things. Obviously, the Royal Navy has the white ensign, but the Union Jack is the official flag of the UK. And then on top of that, you might also have a courtesy flag acknowledging the the port that you happen to be in. So you can have a ship that's quite happily sitting there in the middle of the day in a friendly port, but it might be flying three separate flags just to make sure that all these points are made clear to everybody. Stafford Magnus asks, if the King George V had been fitted with the 16-inch guns and three triple turrets intended for the Lions, what impact could this have had on the engagements the King George V were involved in? Well, you can take two possible outcomes from this, one very negative, one relatively positive. The very negative one would be just to point out that, well, the 16-inch guns with the best will in the world probably wouldn't have been ready till 42-43, so... Um, the impact they would have had would have been very negative because the King George V wouldn't have had any guns, which is um, something of a negative modifier to a battleship's ability to inflict pain and destruction on the enemy. But assuming that we sort of hand wave that and say, OK, the King George V were, are designed for whatever reason with the 16-inch guns, maybe the, they get delayed for a few months by bureaucracy and then like the North Carolinas, they are able to be escalator clausd up up to 16 inch armament so they're into service as such it, it, it if you look at the different engagements the amount of impact is going to vary i mean when you're talking about fighting against Scharnhorst at the battle of north cape hms duke of york well, Duke of York won that engagement rather handily with its 14-inch guns. The 16-inch guns, they're just going to cause a bit more damage. Um, so that's not so much of a major factor. Where it, they could have made a big difference in terms of the engagements that the King George of were involved with, big surface engagements, are actually the, the two fights with Bismarck. Because, well... Hopefully the 16-inch triples would have been a bit more reliable than the 14-inch quads and twins on the on the Prince of Wales. So in the initial battle of the Denmark Strait, this could actually have a major di difference, both actually in two terms. One, if Prince of Wales is so obviously carrying such heavier firepower compared to Hood, it's possible that Admiral Holland might switch his flag before he leaves and sail in Prince of Wales at which point Prince of Wales is leading the column and basically taking the hits instead of Hood, and with hopefully working guns and fairly big, powerful guns, it potentially might win a gun duel with Bismarck outright without um, Hood ever getting exploded, leaving obviously Hood free to prey on Prince Eugen and or help with Bismarck. Um... So that, that's a possibility. I mean, it might have just gone roughly the same as historically, but even then, uh, uh, the 14-inch hits that hit Bismarck obviously would be more damaging if they were 15, if they were 16-inch hits. So there's that. Um, and obviously, you'd be getting off, assuming the turrets are somewhat more reliable, more shots, so there's a chance for additional hits. When you flip over round to the final battle, if King George V is carrying the 16-inch guns instead of 14-inch guns, well... Uh, Bismarck's still dead, so yeah, it doesn't overall change the outcome that much, but a modern powerful set of 16-inch guns on King George V might well do a little bit more damage to the Bismarck, which might which would 
might end up sending the Bismarck down a bit earlier, which might settle some of the on ongoing arguments on the internet as to what exactly sank Bismarck um, a little bit more easily. Louis Maskell asks, I think I get the theory of why the German high seas fleet used 11-inch guns rather than 12-inch like everyone else, but I'm struggling to understand why, with the Kaiser and Wittelsbach pre-dreadnoughts, they dropped from the 11-inch of the Brandenburgs to the 9.4-inch. That strikes me as an armoured cruiser calibre by the late 1890s, by the time they were built. I presume I'm missing something, but what? So the reason is actually weirdly rather simple um although it takes a little bit of digging to get around to appreciate exactly what the germans were on about at the time bearing in mind we're talking about the 1890s the range of engagement is actually still pretty close in and well as we see with world war one world war and going into the interwar period not necessarily so much world war Two, but still um Different navies have very different ideas about what range you're actually going to be fighting at. Obviously, historically, the the French thought in World War One, in the World War One period, that fights were going to be what was actually incredibly short range. The Germans a little bit longer than that. The British longer still, and the Americans thought it was going to be at ridiculously long range, um, which uh, it, it it changed about a bit by World War Two. Um, but that was basically the the paradigm in the 1910s and 20s. Now, in the 1890s, the Germans thought that the ranges of combat were going to stay pretty short, and they were on the shorter side of the engagement range bracket anyway. And then that meant that with their 9.4-inch gun, the 240mm gun, at the kind of ranges they were talking about, the their 9.4 inch gun actually had the penetration to punch through the belt armor of most of the ships that they could expect to be fighting obviously the 11 inch gun could do the same thing but the key difference was that whilst the 9.4 inch gun was smaller and obviously smaller shell smaller bursting charge it could fire a lot quicker and so the the theory was bearing in mind you're still talking about the kind of the the, the hail of fire being the dominant way of thinking at this point, the Germans were basically thinking, well, if we use the 9.4 inch gun, we can't hit our enemy as hard with each main gun shot, but at the rate of fire we can put out, we can probably hit them three or four times in the time it takes them to hit us once. And three or four 9.4 inch shells will probably do more collective damage to the enemy than a single 11 or 12 inch shell would do to us. Plus it meant that obviously the mountings were lighter so that they could devote more weight to other parts of the ship um which is which is an additional advantage but it basically came down to that that idea that it's going to be fighting an extremely close range at which point we we won't rate a fire because the penetration's good enough um obviously that fell off rather abruptly once uh, proper range finders and um salvo firing and the in general increase in naval gunnery ranges that all that that all allowed for and entailed came in towards the end of the 1890s and the beginning of the 1900s but well hindsight's 2020 and uh, they didn't have any psychics in their midst at the time spartan asks can you tell us briefly what went wrong with operation wikinger so what went wrong with this operation which in english ops operation viking the exact accounts vary depending on what you read, but from, from a source that I've been able to find that seems to quote significant portions of the original German reports, um, obviously translated into English because my GCSE German is not up to the task of reading massive amounts of World War II documents, um, it's basically a massive communications failure. So... German Operational High Command had set out clear rules, for obvious reasons, as to how the Kriegsmarine and Luftwaffe were supposed to cooperate when it came to operating in the North Sea and other similar uh, areas where they were both going to be trying to attack enemy targets. They were supposed to tell each other what was happening. So if, um, if uh, the... Kriegsmarine were going to send out ships, they would say to the Luftwaffe, all right, we're going to send ships out... They're going to operate in this area, so please only attack targets in this other area. Don't attack in... And and obviously, if the Luftwaffe is sending out a strike force, then they say, well, we're going to have a strike force. They're going to head over this route, so can you tell the ships if they see aircraft coming in this direction, please keep an eye out and don't shoot at them. 
So this is all well and good. However, on this particular day, the Kriegsmarine decided they wanted to go and attack some British fishing trawlers off Dogger Bank because, well, the British fishing fleet off Dogger Bank never catches a break. Um, and they decided to send out a half flotilla of destroyers. All well and good. However, at the same time, uh, Flieger Corps 10, which or uh, which was um, at the time based in northern Germany, decided they wanted to attack Allied shipping in the Thames and Humber estuaries. So they sent out a strike force of bombers. And they told the Kriegsmarine that what they were doing. The officer in the Kriegsmarine who was supposed to pass this on to the operational commanders of that part of the Kriegsmarine's operations failed to actually do his job and tell anyone that this was happening. Equally, however, the Kriegsmarine just flat out didn't tell the Luftwaffe directly what was happening, but what they did do is they requested air cover, but they didn't get a response from the Luftwaffe, although you could argue that the Luftwaffe should have figured this out, um, that well, the Kriegsmarine doesn't ask for an air escort unless there's something there to escort, but nobody really put two and two together. So both sides had kind of told the other what was going on and neither side actually knew what was going on. Then partway through the operation, somebody in the Kriegsmarine realised what was what had, was potentially about to occur or might occur and asked for... Uh, the Luftwaffe to tell the bombers that were airborne please don't attack shipping in this area because they're probably friendly apparently for whatever reason that part of the Luftwaffe couldn't talk to the Flieger Corps 10 bombers that were in the air they said maybe you should tell the destroyers not to shoot at our aircraft uh, the cruise marine were like well uh, we're more concerned about you bombing our ships and so there was a big argument about that no one actually told anyone out at sea that anything was going on and so in the evening, um, the destroyers are merrily running along and they see an aircraft and the aircraft's not flashing any recognition signals because why would it? Because the aircraft doesn't know that there's any friendly ships around. And so the uh, the ships go, right, well, this aircraft's not flashing recognition signals. It's flying around. It must be hostile. Let's start shooting at it. The aircraft goes, I don't like being shot at, so uh, I will turn around and bomb the Englander. Uh, and... Did a pretty impressive job, actually, considering we, what we were talking about, Heinkel 111's, 111's and level bombing earlier, because he actually hit a fast-moving destroyer. Uh, unfortunately, that was the Liebrecht Mars. Um, yeah. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, so Liebrecht Mars, poor old thing, hit badly damaged on fire. A bomber gets shot at a bit more, wanders off, comes back, has another go, um, possibly scores some more hits. Liebrecht Mars explodes breaks in half and sinks only just over 50 of her crew survive and in the middle of it all for random fun the max schultz just randomly detonates uh, as it turns out the british had actually been deploying mines in that general area but the reports were so confused um i mean the the, the, the aircraft only thought it was attacking one ship the germans Apparently, all various ones of them had seen this aircraft, but how the aircraft hadn't seen them, no one knows. So eventually, the uh, the Kriegsmarine investigation kind of sorted it out and went, it's probable that Liebrecht Mars was hit by a bomb, and then whether or not the second explosion that finished it off and broke it in half was a bomb or a mine, they're not, the jury's a bit out on, but it's almost certain Max Schultz did hit a mine directly. And so, yeah, you get this wonderful uh, situation where the Germans send out a half flotilla of destroyers and a maritime strike force. The British have no idea what's going on and they have a few fishing boats wandering around merrily who don't actually get involved at all and yet it ends up being a British tactical victory because the Germans lose two destroyers, get another one uh, another one damaged and the Luftwaffe ends up with a slightly shot up aircraft. Um, all with the British not actually being anywhere in sight. So yeah, well done. Uh, the Imperial Japanese Navy and Army would be proud. William H. Burke III asks, Some modern tanks are designed for extreme ease of maintenance. Hearing you mention how expensive warship engine refits could be, I wonder, has any ship ever been designed initially to be easy to give it major component upgrades? 
and if not, what, change, what things, if any, did naval architects do to make future upgrades more feasible? Enter stage left, IJN Mogami. You will notice in this picture she is carrying triple six inch turrets. These things are lies. The Japanese did not intend the Mogami to have triple six inch turrets. The Japanese had run up against the treaty limit for eight inch cruisers and decided they wanted more eight inch cruisers, but they couldn't be seen to be so flagrantly violating the treaties just yet. And so they built these uh, Mogami class with, well, triple six inch turrets. The fact that they also manufactured twin 8-inch turrets in exactly the same numbers and specifically designed the barbette and shell rooms of the Megamis to be able to handle the larger shells and the minute they'd walked back on their treaty obligations mysteriously lifted off the 6-inch turrets and dropped in 8-inch turrets and made them into heavy cruisers. Well, that's just a lot of careful planning, isn't it? So yes, um, the... Megamis are basically the example of ships specifically designed to be able to have major component upgrades in the future. Now, as far as other upgrades were concerned, there were some things that naval architects did do to try and uh, allow for upgrades where they thought there was a chance of these happening. So, for example, whilst engine refits were expensive and costly, uh, quite a number of the larger capital ships were designed with various plates and measures in place that could be, relatively speaking, easily removed to allow access for, well, general maintenance and repair, but also re uh, replacement later down the line, because capital ships at the specific time we're talking about, like mid-1910s, 1920s, etc., they were designed with the thought that they were going to be in service for quite a while, and so some kind of full upgrade like that might well be necessary. Another example would be the South Dakota and North Carolina class battleships, although technically probably should be the other way around, where their 16-inch 45 caliber guns were designed to be able to handle the AP Mark VIII shell, whereas the 16-inch guns on the Colorado class, which were much earlier, which were also 16-inch uh, 45 caliber, were obviously before the Super Heavy Mark VIII had been designed, and so the shell handling facilities on the later US ships were able to handle the Mark 8 as well as the older shells if they absolutely had to, although as it turned out, they didn't. Although you can tell that they would have had this capability because the high explosive shells that were used on the North Carolinas and South Dakotas were significantly shorter than the AP Mark 8. Antifa Slayer asks, considering what happened to them, what should the East Asia Squadron have done differently? Tried sailing through the Indian Ocean, perhaps? Poor old Von Spey really was between a rock and a hard place. Um, there was little chance of sticking around Sing Tao because he knew sooner or later the Japanese would be coming for him, if no one else was, and the Japanese Navy definitely outgunned the East Asia Squadron. He didn't want to head south southwest to try and head into the Indian Ocean because, well, one, in that direction lay HMAS Australia, which he didn't rate his chances against. And even if somehow he managed to give HMAS Australia the slip, well, you've then got to somehow still get home. And what are the choices you can get? Try and get through the Indian Ocean. There's a fair number of British ships um, there. There's some French and Russian ships on the way as well. And then you have a choice, well, you're not going to try going through the Suez Canal because one, that boxes you right in, two, it's controlled by the British, and three, even if they let you through, which, to be honest, if you tried, they very well might, mainly because you then get to meet the Mediterranean fleet uh, at the other end. Then your only other option is try and head down the coast of South of uh, Eastern Africa around South Africa, where, again... It's a it's a semi natural choke point. The British can be waiting for you. South Africa is in is controlled by the British, although they had a couple of years, a couple of decades earlier, had a couple of wars about that. Um, and it's a very long distance to go. Basically, the Indian Ocean at this point, outside of um, the little bits of German East Africa, is very much in British hands. As I say, the Suez Canal is in in British hands, South Africa is in British hands, various parts of the East African coast are in British hands, of course, India, which includes the areas we now know as Pakistan, Bangladesh and Sri Lanka, was in British hands. <laughs> the list goes on. So yeah, 
Going through the Indian Ocean is a very bad idea. Um, even if somehow you manage, magically manage to make it through, well, you're going to end up in the South Atlantic, same as you would going across the Pacific. At least going across the Pacific, there weren't quite as many British ships. Um, so yeah, you can't stay, you can't go that, you can't go south, you can't go south west. Your pretty much only choice is to head across the Pacific. Now, um, in so doing, he he did almost all the right things. I think the what the one area where he made a slight mess up was that he chose to try and attack the Falkland Islands. If he hadn't, if he'd just motored clean on past them, given that um, Invincible and her sister ship were in the process of coaling up and needed several hours to get up steam, if Von Spee had skirted the Falklands completely and motored on north, he probably could have got enough of a head start that by the time anybody actually noticed that, hey, the Germans are overdue or maybe someone spots them further up he might have had enough of a head start to either give them give sturdy the slip or just flat out outrun him heading for a safer port of course there's the possibility that either princess royal or elements of the mediterranean fleet come out to block him but at least when he's in once he's in the atlantic he's got options of various neutral ports he could try and duck into and at least inter there if he's blockaded in um, everywhere else is basically just putting yourself in a circle of guns and hoping that everybody shoots but somehow misses you. Luke's the Lynx asks, Could HMS Iron Duke have been reactivated and used as a convoy escort in the Mediterranean during the Second World War? In a theoretical unlimited money situation, of course, um, but <laughs> in the more real-world practical situation the Royal Navy found itself in, not really. I mean, here's Iron Duke in the late 1930s at the Spithead Naval Review. Um, obviously she's the one in the foreground. Now you might notice there's a couple of things that have changed about her since you've seen her in her glory days in the First World War. Namely, she's missing two turrets. Um, the, the forward one is just a capped barbette now, and, well, the aft turret is now a 5.25-inch twin um, because she was a gunnery training ship. And, well... Yeah, that there's a there's so many things that would have had to have been done to her. I mean, for a start, she's not had any major engine refits because of her time mostly deactivated um, in the the better part of ten fifteen years. So she her power plant's probably going to break down at some point. She's also had a bunch of armor stripped away, which is why you might notice she's riding quite high in the water, amongst other things. Uh, obviously she's missing two of her main gun turrets as she's not been in regular service in the 1930s as a frontline battleship she's also not had any refits involving increasing or any anti-aircraft weaponry except for that twin 5.25 that was stuck in mainly as a training uh, item so yeah if they were going to bring her back into service you'd end up well, you'd have to try and find some main turrets, or maybe you leave them off to enhance the AA, but you'd have to do a complete anti-aircraft battery refit. You'd end up with a ship that can only make about 21 knots anyway, and is probably going to be out of action with machinery casualty at some point, sooner or later. And with the best will in the world, she also hasn't had any major deck armor increases since the latter part of World War I. So she's not going to be particularly well protected against bombs or torpedoes, um, given that, again, World War I capital ship. So, yeah, it, it's not really practical, I'm afraid. She, she'd be too slow and too underprotected to make much of a difference of anything. Um, she might have some utility as an Indian Ocean convoy escort. I mean, they'd use the Georgia Savaroff in that position. And that's mainly because, well, even with only three 13.5-inch guns, uh, the gun turrets, she's still capable of scaring off German surface raiders or Japanese surface raiders in the sort of our merchant cruiser category kind of thing. But, yeah, not much more than that, I'm afraid. And that's, of course, before the Luftwaffe bombed her in Scapa Flow. Sweet 420 Den asks, What was the feasibility of the Anglo-French fleet to force the Straits open at Gallipoli and thus avoiding the catastrophe of the, la catastrophe of the land battle? Well, I've covered how you could get through the Dardanelles before in a number of different questions. I'll be very brief on this one, but if you're going to confine it purely to the big Anglo-French attempt to force the Straits rather than an earlier point, 
Yes, you could if you were willing to take a few more losses. Um, obviously, in hindsight, we know that they were almost through the minefields. So there is that. So that, yes, in, in absolute terms, they could have made it. And if they had pushed on a little bit further, then they would have managed to break through. Yes, they would have lost more ships and it would have been very messy. But I think losing a few more mo largely obsolete pre-dreadnoughts, while it would have been a heavy price to pay, would still be a small price compared to the absolute carnage that was the landings themselves. The other way to get through with perhaps fewer casualties would have been to preempt Jackie Fisher's ideas about how to go about landing in the Baltic, grab a few of these pre-dreadnoughts, stick them into dockyard quickly and fit them all up with some quick and nasty bulges. Just really, really big ones. Doesn't really matter. They don't have to be pretty. Um, and just force them through, sail them through, because that's the lack of underwater protection is what did in most of the pre-dreadnoughts that ended up getting sunk. So yeah, stuff them to the gunnels with bulges, seal off every unnecessary compartment deep down, weld everything up, make them as watertight as possible, drive them straight through, because if you can't get the uh, proper military minesweepers, you're going to have to use your your battleships and at that point then you won't hopefully you won't be losing ships to individual mine strikes they can take a mine and either keep going or possibly take a mine and then pull back and that way you'd quite easily force the straits gabriel a hawkins asks i'm told one of the planned counters to operation sea line was to sweep the channel with britain's battle line and this plan constituted a significant deterrent to german invasion plans as the luftwaffe had a questionable questionable ability to penetrate the armour of the heavy British units. However, the Germans had also placed sizable shore batteries on the western coast of France, as well as railway guns to assist in the planned invasion, that certainly had the power to breach battleship-grade armour. Did the British have a plan to counter these shore batteries in the event of an invasion? So this is one of the more hotly debated topics around Operation Sea Lion, at least when it comes to what the British would have done in response, because... Well, you can find documents and sources to support the view that the British would have charged him with all the available battleships. You can find sources that say from the Admiralty that they wouldn't have sent in any capital ships and everything in between. Um, there was a lot of back and forth. The official line from the Admiralty technically was we're keeping our capital ships back until we can, in the event of an invasion, unless uh, we're absolutely necessary and certain caveats can be made. Um, on the other hand, some of the uh, officers who are actually on the ships and such like, as well as, well, practical experience looking at how the Royal Navy acted would suggest that if push came to shove, caution would probably go to the wind. But nevertheless, when it comes to shore batteries in particular, there were two factors that would the Royal Navy would have exploited, one of which is... The weather, specifically night, which is a form of weather when you are talking about sea and air operations. And secondly is, well, the Germans would have been on the wrong side of the channel with uh, as it relates to these guns. So for passing through the Dover Straits, which is where the entirety of the English Channel can be covered by the shore guns, you would just pass through at night. I mean, a night attack would be the preferred method for the British anyway, so that makes sense. The other part is that assuming you're going to clear the Dover batteries or, well, technically the, the Calais batteries if you're talking about the Germans, but never mind. Um, once you're into the channel itself, the channel gets wider and you're out of any practical range of a shore battery to engage you. But if you're still remaining within the range of a shore battery of any description, there are a few things to remember. One of which is that a lot of shore batteries and railway guns fire a lot slower than battleships because battleships obviously have this whole massive system, their, their whole purpose is dedicated to firing the main guns. Uh, a railway gun, not so much. They tend to fire a lot, lot slower. And also accuracy, um, as actually covered in the video earlier this week. The battleships have all sorts of fancy range-finding equipment, so they can fire faster and more accurately than most shore batteries can. And so they're probably going to ignore some of the shore batteries who aren't really going to be able to engage them if they're merrily slaughtering their way through German landing craft on the English side of the channel. And if they do become a specific problem, then one or two battleships will probably be charged for engaging in counter-battery fire. Or if the 
invasion forces are right onto the beach, you'd probably have the big Dover battery guns doing a counter battery duel with their German counterparts across the channel to free up the battleships for direct fire missions against the beaches themselves that the coastal guns can't aim at. Gotta find my dad asks, I was wondering how the brig and the justice system aboard warships works. Uh, he then relates an, an account about his great uncle serving as an anti-aircraft gunner being in the brig and then being released from the brig to return to his AA position in the middle of the Battle of the Coral Sea. So he asks, I was curious about temporary release from detainment. Was this common practice in times of enemy engagement? And what kind of offences would land someone in the brig? And how would justice, justice be administered whilst at sea? So the brig, which is kind of an American term, but we'll use it because most people know what it means these days, or otherwise confinement aboard a warship, is actually pretty rare as a punishment. Because in such a tight community as a warship, disciplinary infractions are usually a case of you did something wrong but you're not a risk to the rest of the crew and you're still able to do your duties because bear in mind you still have to feed this person you, know, you still have to look look after them to whatever degree is necessary and there's a lot of jobs that need doing aboard a warship and not that many people to do them so just basically putting someone in a cell and the ship having to incur most of the costs of keeping them around and getting none of the benefits of having a trained crewman means that if, if you're going to lock someone up they've either got, got to done something really bad or be a danger to everybody else so most of the time punishment would be a case of handing them extra duties punishment duties um, making them subject to certain restrictions in what they could do in their off-duty time and such like and to be honest, if if the what they'd done required a heavier punishment than that, at least when we talk about the World War One, World War Two period, you probably didn't want them on the ship at all. <laughs> um, to be perfectly frank, and uh, there would usually be some ship or other that could take them away. Um, yeah, you, you would normally you would put them in the brig at such a point that you couldn't actually trust them anymore. Now, in peacetime. And on certain ships and in various navies, this may change. But in general wartime, it would have to be very specific to, to end up in, in the brig. That said, if the ship's under attack and you need every man to defend the ship, then if this person in any way, shape or form has applicable skills that would help to defend the ship, and they're not an immediate danger to everybody else aboard then yeah, of course, you get them in action because any any single person can make a difference and the last thing you want to do is to report back to the ad Admiralty in question. Well, yes, the ship could have been saved, but the one officer or man who had the particular technical knowledge and action station to be in that area that could have saved the ship, well, we had him in the brig throughout the entire thing because we didn't like him or because he, he'd done something separately wrong. Um, the Admiralty will haul you over the coals a lot more for losing your ship than they will for temporarily letting a brigged uh, or imprisoned man or officer out. As far as what would exactly land you in the brig, quote-unquote, well, the ship would have to be at sea, otherwise you'd just be sent ashore um, if you were going to be confined. And if you were at sea, as I say, it, it depends to a great degree on the navy in question, the culture of that navy whether or not the ship is at war, and also the captain, because, well, the captain's word is law most of the time on a warship. So, yeah, if it's, if it's peacetime and the captain's a fairly strict disciplinarian, you might find all sorts of things could wind you up with a short stay confined in some way, shape, or form. Uh, whereas if it's wartime, that's going to be lessened. And also, as I say, the, since it's the captain um, and in some cases other members of the senior staff who will make, be making these decisions exactly how they stand on how useful you might be would also affect whether or not you end up in the brig or given some other kind of duty so it's, it's not really a question that can be boxed into to give a specific answer mrs gabriel a hawkins asks 
I've often wondered what was the typical age for boys to be sent to sea, either as officers or as regular seamen, as it doesn't seem credible that experienced seamen would take orders from inexperienced 12-year-old officers, especially in stressful situations such as battle or violent storms, especially if those orders were blatantly wrong. Uh, is this my modern American mindset that's unable to fully comprehend the disciplined hierarchical world of the British Navy in the age of sail, or is there something else that explains why this worked? So once the rank of midshipman became a kind of favoured area for young boys to enter the fleet as part of their naval career, and bear in mind that originally the rank of midshipman was had a completely different purpose, but we're talking about this sort of mid to late age of sail um, repurposing of the rank. They typically join around age 13, 14, a little bit earlier, a little bit later, one way or the other. Um, but yeah, sort of um, early to going on mid-teens would be kind of the period that they would they would come in. Now, in terms of giving orders, yes, they technically outranked the uh, the ordinary seamen. Practically speaking, everybody on board knew that, as pretty much as you say, the <laughs> no one's going to be taking orders from a twelve-year-old who has no idea what he's doing in the middle of a battle. The midshipmen were there primarily to learn from the more experienced and uh, higher ranked officers and indeed if they were any good if they were going to be any good they'd also be learning from the men as well that even if they might notionally be in charge of something or other but bear in mind that there'd be plenty of lieutenants on board and any orders that a midshipman might pass down again assuming they knew half of what they should would simply be relaying orders from higher up you would not trust a midshipman in anything approaching ordinary circumstances to be the one making the decisions and giving the orders so uh, let's say for example if you're on a gun deck in the middle of a battle you might have a master gunner or another officer of some description calling the order to fire for the gun gun deck that order might be relayed by midshipmen at various points because obviously it's a very noisy environment but you wouldn't expect a midshipman to actually give the order to fire of their own volition. So, yeah, I mean, as the as the midshipman gained experience, bear in mind you needed at least three years' experience as a midshipman before you could sit for a lieutenant's commission, then by the end of that period, they probably were fairly competent at giving low-level day-to-day orders for the specific instances that they might end up having to supervise in their in the day-to-day operation of the ship but once it comes to big major situations like battles and storms they're effectively messengers Um, if if you get to a point in a battle or a storm where the highest ranking officer that you can get something out of is a midshipman you're probably already in a lifeboat or a impromptu raft at that point (laughs) And as we're nearly done, we'll press on without the interlude. So Mem Mori asks, It seems large destroyer designs, like French and German ones, tend to have more drawbacks than advantages. What kind of things could be changed to allow the, that direction of development to work? Something like Shimakaze, maybe? And finally, were there any significant advantages that these large destroyers actually offered that were crucial to their respective navies? A lot of the problems that arose from having overly large destroyers basically came down to the fundamental fact that the navies that built them were usually smaller than other navies, and thus they had to try and fit as much bang for their buck into specific ships rather than generalised classes. And this is always a bit of a, a bit of the quandary that you have. If you're a large navy you tend to have lots of commitments, which means that since no one has an unlimited money machine, you ending, end up needing to have lots and lots of decent ships rather than a handful of wonder ships. So this is why you see, uh, for example, the UK at the end, in the beginning of World War II mass-producing things like the LM. N classes rather than mass producing the tribals, the US mass produces the Fletchers, etc. Whereas you look at the smaller navies like um, Germany, France, 
Egypt and to a certain extent Italy and also to a reasonable extent Japan. They try and get, they know they can't match the US and UK in destroyer numbers, so they try and build larger destroyers that in then theoretically have a comfortable individual advantage over a single destroyer they might meet up with or possibly two. Now, the other problem generally comes from trying to do too much. So the Germans tried to put too much gun on their ships. The French, they tried to make them too fast. The Japanese tried too much of everything. Um, because again, if you're paying this amount of money and you're building a few large ships, the temptation is to try and cram absolutely anything and everything on board to make sure you're getting the absolute best that you can. So to make it work, well, you have to take a sensible view as to what makes a viable combat unit. So for the Germans, that's tone down the size of your guns. For the French, it's you don't need to go quite that fast. For the Japanese, it's, uh, well, pick something and do that. D stop trying to be a, a small light cruiser. I mean, there's ways of doing a light, a sort of a light cruiser on a destroyer hull, but one of those things isn't literally putting a light cruiser on a destroyer hull. And so when you look at the large destroyers, um, something like, say, a tribal class or some of the US destroyer leader types, and to be fair, some of the Japanese types as well, the best way of building a large destroyer is to choose a specific part of the destroyer mission paradigm that you're going to emphasize. So the tribal case, cases, that's guns. In the Shimakaze's cases, I guess that's torpedoes, um, etc. Use your extra size and displacement for that. Don't go overboard on all the others. And if you need to, cut the things, other things down a bit. So you then make a destroyer that's good at one thing above most other destroyers and bear in mind yes you normally have speed protection firepower in destroyers you don't really have protection so with destroyers it's more like speed guns and torpedoes so yeah do one thing really really well if necessary trim out a couple of one or two bits from something else and keep the rest the same that's how you make a successful large destroyer sdf7 asks a relatively long and complicated question that basically amounts to why didn't escort carriers get designed and ordered significantly earlier than they did in historical timelines? There's a whole medley of factors, really, but to briefly highlight some of the more important ones, some plans for what we might recognise as an escort carrier or a merchant aircraft carrier had been devised in the 1930s. So it was being thought about, but it was a little bit on the back burner for a variety of reasons. And one of those was a perceived threat. You've got to bear in mind that although anti-submarine warfare tactics were under development in the 1930s, there was in some quarters perhaps a little bit of an over-reliance on ASDIC-SONAR as the fait accompli for getting rid of submarines and well if you've got a system you can mount on destroyers and other escorts to get rid of your submarines why do you need this sort of small aircraft carrier going around there was of course also the idea you could hunt submarines with fleet aircraft carriers but hms courageous tells us quite how well that went um yeah not a good idea but on top of that there's also need and it's not just need of the merchant ships or need of the navy or need of anything else. It's the overall needs of the nation. So in the early sort of 1939, 1940, there certainly was a need for these kinds of ships. But the one country that actually needed them in a big way, which was the UK, had rather more important things to worry about when it came to things like the Battle of Britain. And so there's no point in having an aircraft carrier of any size if you don't have any aircraft to operate from it and the Royal Navy was having to fight tooth and nail just to get the aircraft that it was getting on its fleet carriers let alone distributing dozens of flights across lots of smaller platforms with the Royal Air Force screaming and quite rightly for to a certain extent for practically every bit of industrial infrastructure capable of producing an aircraft the size of a fighter to be churning out hurricanes and spitfires. <laughs> 
And lastly, is also the it's not just the perceived threat of the U-boats, it's also about aircraft, because remember the catapult armed merchantman, the immediate predecessor to the escort carrier, was mainly about shooting down long-range German aircraft. Long-range maritime strike and patrol aircraft flat out weren't a threat during the 1930s. Few enough of them existed, and the ones that did were basically either incapable of actually harming anything or would have to get so close to harm somebody that the AA defences in theory should be able to take care of them. And of course, when you look at who everybody's thinking of fighting at those at that time, well, if you're fighting Japan, they're going to be using their own aircraft carriers. So you'd be using your carriers to counter them. If you're fighting the Germans, up until 1940, the Germans don't have any Atlantic-facing uh, airports and runways of, that are anywhere close to the Atlantic, nor for most of the 1930s do they have aircraft capable of long-distance patrols over the Atlantic, so how are they even going to get there? It's not an issue. The only people you really have to worry about are the Italians, because, well, they're in the middle of the Mediterranean, and you're not going to use escort carriers against the Italians. You're either going to use your own land-based aircraft if they come out far enough, um, places like Malta and such, or, again, you're going to use your fleet carriers. So the advent of... Suddenly Germany has lots of um, airfields on, in Western France and now has this bunch of FW200s. This is something they weren't really anticipating. William Urbanski asks, Why did a lot of guns, both large and small, have bell-shaped or flared muzzles? I've heard at one time it was believed the muzzle needed to be stronger to handle the pressure as the projectile left the bore, but as early as the US Civil War, and possibly earlier, this was found to be unnecessary, and you started to see cannons with straight lines all the way forward. So why did this practice continue in so many guns after this time? Now, it's not definitive, because, well... Yeah, this was a fun one. There there were a lot of, shall we say, dissenting opinions about this. But what seems to make the most sense to me as an engineer, going back through it, is that this is an outgrowth of a much earlier practice. So if you look at much earlier cannons, they are banded. Now, they're banded, well, in part because initially they were built kind of like barrels, um, and so barrels needed banding, and so do the guns. But even once they were cast they were still in need of certain reinforcement banding at various points because of failures and such like. And one of these bands, in fact, one of the heaviest bands, was either cast or fitted around the muzzle of the gun to stop it cracking. The flare seems to be an evolution of that, and it's just basically becoming more integral to the gun itself. Now, as far as handling the pressure as the projectile left the bore, well, the rest of the cannon is having pretty much the same issues, um, except that, obviously, the as the ball leaves the gun, you get the exhaust and the pressure all going out, so it's not pressing on it quite as hard at that point. However, the thing you've got to remember is that well, as you can probably see from these guns, the guns taper going forward, so there's less and less material containing the pressure as you go forward. And along the rest of the length of the cannon, that pressure at any given point is being distributed pretty much in all directions possible through the rest of the gun. So whilst failures obviously can and did occur, they're not quite as common as where you would usually get minor engineering failures that could then turn into major ones, which was at the muzzle. Because the muzzle, obviously, being the cutoff point, well, it's only got half as many directions within the material to redirect the energy that it is under. You've also got it subjected to quite a differential, because somewhere like halfway down the cannon barrel, it's going to heat up, and then it's going to slowly cool down, because of its mass and because of where it is relative to the rest of the gun. The muzzle, on the other hand, is going to be heated from more than one direction, because obviously that flare of uh, fire is going to spill around it. It's also going to expand differently, because it's not confined at one end. So the outer edge of the barrel has a lot more capacity for expansion than 
the than maybe even a 0.23 inches down the gun and it's also going to cool quicker because greater surface area and usually stuck out in as far as possible or outside the hull of the ship all these things do make some a slight difference and so if you are going to get cracking as in not the kind of immediately fatal this gun explodes cracking but the kind of this gun might explode in two or three shots cracking it's going to start happening at the barrel uh, unless you have really good metallurgy and or various other changes that you make and so one of the easiest ways of countering that is to put in well initially a, a band but in this case a flare because you're introducing a lot more material to the muzzle which means it's going to retain heat longer so it's not going to be snapping back and forth between hot and cold quite as much and also there's just a lot more mass to it which means that if these kind of micro fractures start to develop they're going to find it much harder to propagate to such degree that they're going to compromise the structural integrity of the gun because there's just a lot more iron there to break as opposed to a sort of a straight line run so yeah it's kind of a, a long-term insurance thing you you overbuild it and it's more it's likely to last longer now as i this is only one of many possible explanations that i've managed to find in my research but as an engineer and with my knowledge of particularly of engineering materials such as iron and steel it seems to make the most logical sense to me if i was faced with the problem of building a cannon or cannon-like projectile launching weapon from scratch that would actually be one of my major concerns where is the initial point of failure like likely to start assuming the rest of the material is cast uniformly and probably a similar kind of safety measure to what i'd design in to be perfectly honest brett mcdowell asks you've mentioned many times how many navies complied with naval treaties by simply lying how well known was it that these lies were so prevalent and why was nothing really done about it? Intelligence about it was patchy for the most part, and by the time it started to become blatantly obvious, the naval treaty system was on the verge of breaking down anyway. This is in the sort of mid-ish 1930s. So everyone had their suspicions, um, and some suspicions were stronger than others, but two things one it's a different thing to have suspicions as opposed to being able to prove them and the subsidiary of that is well if you're being very technical about how you interpret the rules you don't necessarily want to call someone else out on it for fear they might turn around and do the same to you but the other thing is people really well say most people the big powers the ones who might actually do the calling out part and trying to force people back into line they kind of wanted the treaty system to work and there's only a certain amount uh, you can do at least they thought without making it so blatantly obvious to everyone that absolutely everyone's going to turn on someone and it turns out well yeah that's true but by the time that happened the treaty system had broken down anyway but regardless the idea was that if if it's the smaller navies breaking the treaty limits by a little bit by lying a few a thousand or two tons here or there if the larger powers could kind of turn a little bit of a blind eye to that on the grounds that well it doesn't really matter if the Kriegsmarine is building 12,000 or 13,000 or 14,000 ton heavy cruisers because let's face it they can only build half a dozen of them and we've got two or three dozen so they're gonna lose anyway and if we could make a big fuss about it then they'll withdraw from the treaty system entirely they'll build something that might actually legitimately be a big problem and also if the treaty system collapses then we have to spend vast amounts of money because the medium and to large size powers such as uh, say japan are going to take that as carte blanche to start building their really big designs and then we have to match them and so on and so forth so it was a when you're dealing with the smaller navies it's just a little bit too much like hard work and cost to actually expose them even if you know about it and that's that's basically it. and i say by, and by the time it became really really obvious that people were quite flagrantly cheating on a level that is actually worrying 
most of everyone except for <laughs> the UK, France, and um, the USA had walked out of the naval treaty system already. Indy Nidal's fursona. Okay. Says... <laughs> Were there any serious attempts by either the Kriegsmarine or IJN to put the Panama Canal out of action? There were a few plans, not really any major attempts. Uh, the Germans had Operation Pelican, the Japanese obviously had their plans with the I-400 carrier subs. But in terms of actual attacks, no, not really. The thing was, obviously... The Germans weren't going to attack the Panama Canal before the end of 1941 because America was neutral and they'd rather it stays that way for as long as possible. Once the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor and America found itself at war with Japan and Germany and everybody else who can comprise the excess powers, the Americans put some rather heavy defences in place because they were worried that the Germans or the Japanese might try and attack the Panama Canal. And, well... That immediately ruled out the easier options like sail a U-boat or a Japanese submarine up and fire torpedoes at the gates. Um, and, well, the Japanese in the early part of the war, with, with that particular uh, tactic ruled out, had a lot of other things to be worrying about in the Pacific campaign. And as far as the Germans were concerned, well, much as the Japanese are very valuable allies... The longer the Panama Canal is open, given that America is somewhat understandably ticked off with Japan at this point, that's more American warships heading through to the Pacific. And the more American warships head through to the Pacific, the fewer American warships there are in the Atlantic. Or so the theory goes. It just turns out that, well, if America is going to have lots of warships in the Pacific, that doesn't necessarily rule it out from having lots of warships in the Atlantic as well. But hey-ho, hindsight. Once it did become apparent that perhaps the Panama Canal was a little bit more of a help to the Allies than it was to the Axis, it was, say, it was basically too late. It was too well defended. It was too far away. Any kind of attempt on it was going to be a very, very, um, shall we say, optimistic attack. And none of them really ever got off the ground. And finally, Dominic von Bismarck asks, Is it possible and realistic to have a battleship using interwar or World War II technology capable of being an efficient icebreaker? Unfortunately not. Uh, basically, as you can see here, icebreakers require a very different hull design to battleships. They need an almost constantly rounding hull. Battleships tend to... When you look at them from a profile view above, you can actually usually see they're kind of a there's a bow and a stern and a largely rectangular section amidships. They also need to have a fairly blunt bow with a fairly quick curve to allow them to ride over the thicker parts of the ice. And all of this means that the average icebreaker is not the world's best open sea boat, and it's also not particularly fast because this whole form is not good for speed. Battleships, on the other hand, well, they need to be very good at open sea and they need to be moving at a fair old clip as well. So these two hull characteristics are completely at odds with each other. The other thing is that battleships generally will have their underwater areas going down quite a fair way and with a lot of older and refitted ships also have bulges incorporated into them and these are very bad when you're trying to pass through ice because the ice that you've just broken tends to pass down the sides of the ship and that's exactly the kind of hull form which gets a lot of ice scraping along the side of your ship uh, so yeah not not a good idea there if you design a battleship that it is in any way shape or form particularly suited to the ice breaking role it's never going to go anywhere fast and it's going to roll so badly the crew's probably going to be half dead from seasickness by the time you get anywhere and if you're trying to use a normal battleship for ice breaking, well, it's they're usually big enough and mean enough to do basic ice breaking with sort of very thin ice anyway, just on account of their sheer mass. Although I wouldn't really want to see what the scratches and dings in the hull look like afterwards. But yeah, if if you're talking about properly heavy ice, 
no. The, the the design compromises you need to make would be completely unacceptable for a battleship. And yeah, you know, the on, the only ones that would really make even half decent icebreakers would probably be something like the Corbeys, Bretagnes, Gangutz, etc. Because those two uh, French and Russian pre World War One dreadnought designs tended to carry their armor belts at relative thickness, relatively high thicknesses, all the way to the front and aft of the ship, which means that, at least as far as ramming ice is concerned, they've probably got a slightly greater advantage in that respect than many others. But yeah, generally speaking, you don't want to use a battleship as an icebreaker. And that brings us to the end of this week's Dry Dock. So some of you might be wondering, well, why such a short Patreon Dry Dock track? Uh, well, I'll explain this briefly. Um, most of you will probably have heard this all... Well, not most of you. Some of you might have heard this already because there should be a live stream going out on Friday before this goes live in which this will also be covered there. But basically, because of the sheer size of the Dry Docks, um, it was just getting completely unworkable. So what I thought about doing and put it to a vote on Patreon and got pretty much, well, not entirely, but near enough unanimous support on was the idea of splitting the dry dock. So what I determined to be the more historic, not historical, because that sounds a bit, um, that's a bit unkind um, and unnecessarily so, the Original timeline history-based questions, shall we say, shall continue in this dry dock format on the Sunday or Saturday if you're a Patreon. Um, so, and so hopefully you probably noticed that pretty much all of these questions are based on specific questions about stuff that happened or was planned to happen or could have happened um, in real life history. The stuff that is is compliant with our timeline. And the questions that are more on the speculative side of sort of what if this really big butterfly flaps its wings and something completely different happens or uh, what does Drac do if he's in charge of a certain fleet or um, any number of other similar sort of alternate history or speculative questions. These kinds of things I will do separately on a live stream the Friday before the Patreon dry dock goes up from now on, and we'll see how that works. So that's kind of split things a little bit, and it means that where the speculative side of things is, which is obviously where, well, you can't really research a, specula a really speculative question, like... Um, <laughs> I don't know, what if Shinano was completed as a third battleship and sent out to fight? The, that That's not something you can look at a book and or uh, documents and go, oh, okay, that's what would have happened because this is what actually happened in a comparative situation. It, it's it's just a, it's not, not possible. So at that point, you either have the basic grounding in naval history to be able to answer it, or you don't. <laughs> and... If you do, then you should be able to answer it pretty much as asked. So I'm going to try that with live stream. I will just have the list of questions. I'll go through the questions. I'll give my answers. And assuming I haven't run out of voice or time by then, uh, when I get to the end of that, well, as usual, take questions from uh, the regular sort of live stream question part. So we'll see how that works this month and next month. And if it works, great. If it doesn't, well, we can always try something else. You never know. But hopefully people like this way of doing things. As far as other channel admin goes, thank goodness I've begun to get more reports over the past week or so of people's Thunderchild posters arriving. So I've been graphing those against when the uh, posters were sent out. And it would appear that... I mean, fair enough, most of them were headed out to the US and it seems that the delay for USPS um, deliveries versus the sort of four to six working days that's advertised on the actual post service that was paid for 
yeah, it's a little bit of a difference. We're talking about five to six weeks different uh, actual posting time. So they're they're running about four to five weeks late, possibly more in some cases. But hopefully now that I've got a couple, several dozen people saying, yes, I've definitely got it. Hopefully those of you who are like, where's my poster? Um, hopefully you've got it now. Um, and if you still don't have it by the time you're listening to this, well, again, please drop me a line and let me know what's going on. Um, the next print run is probably about a week and a half, two weeks out. So if you still haven't received it by then, I'll, I'll send you a new one and buy a different postal service, obviously. Otherwise, we're just feeding some, uh, some, some lucky USPS guy random posters all the time, but never mind. So I think that's all that needs to be said for the moment. Once again, thank you very much for watching, and I hope to see you again in another video.